you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button as well as the bell to be notified of future videos. Thank you. Hello Internet, we are back and I'm excited even if I'm not wearing my normal Air Force blue shirt. Apologies for that, washing days tomorrow. Uh, this came a bit earlier than what I expected. But we have an Air Force man here with us, an African Air Force flight engineer. Aerial Gunner, I suppose you can say it like that, or Air Gunner on the Allos. When you're a crooks, all the Air Force Cross, a man who had a very, very fascinating career. Uh, Stephen Kutsia, or Steve, as some people call him. Now, welcome here. Let me start by that. Steve, very welcome here. Thank you for your time. We appreciate it. May I ask you, where did this start? Where, how did you end up in the Air Force? Why did you make that career? I Chris, thanks very much for the opportunity to chat to you. And uh, man, yeah, where does this start? Quite interesting. And I grew up in the Lowfelt in a little town called Malalan, right next to the game reserve. And uh, I remember I was finishing off my junior school, you know, primary school, standard five. And uh, there was this funny, strange freaking noise with slapping blades in the air. And I thought, geez, what is that? And then rec recognition, that's a freaking helicopter. And uh, the helicopter then landed at our local police station, which wasn't very far from where we lived. We couldn't wait to get out of school, I tell you. Got there. And here's this little drag car thing sitting there in the bush. I'll tell you what a sight. And uh, at that point in time, the pilot was already in the, in the pilot seat. And uh, there was this other funny guy with a bone dome on, you know, helmet thing. He's walking around the outside and giving thumbs up. And the next minute, this, this thing starts whining like crazy. And you see the exhaust gas coming out. And, oh, the, the blades start turning. Quite impressive. And the next minute, this guy takes takes to the air and makes a heck, heck of a cloud of dust. And that was it for me, you know. My dad uh, actually was in the Air Force as well. And uh, you won't believe it, he was a, 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 an electrician at uh, 12 and 24 Squadron in the war. That's why I'm such a bright spark, actually. Anyway, um, I decided there and then that I'm going to be Air Force man. And that was, you know, from then on, schooling was just another step. I've got to get there. Um, I ended up in uh, Lowfelt High in Nell Sprat in the, in the hostel. And uh, studies were studies. I did, I did battle with math. I uh, actually didn't, didn't do well at all with math. So I knew I wanted to do fly. But with no maths, I'm not going to make it. So I was called up for conscription to the Signal Corps in Heidelberg and uh, immediately decided, no, I'm going to join Permanent Force and uh, let's see if I can get into flying in some other way. So June of 1975 is when my mission started. And something that, that I've just remembered, Chris, that's very, very strange. Today, we're talking... And it is the 40th celebration of Operation Super, the 13th of March, where we lost three very good men. And uh, I, I remember that day as clear, clear as you can believe. It's amazing. Anyway, back to when I was a lighty. So there's this fresh guy out of school, six months, running around the parade ground, trying to find out what the heck is going on. It's winter, and uh, there's these funny little people in blue uniforms screaming and shouting, and we're just behaving and trying to get organized, and that's the start of our basics. Immediately, we completed our basics, and uh, I was told that now you're an apprentice. Oh, is that what I'm doing? Okay, cool. What am I going to be studying for now? Is that an apprentice uh, uh, aircraft maintenance engineer? Um, the training that we went through was quite quite amazing. I mean, that's 
you know, I still look back on my career in the Air Force and I'm blessed to know that we were trained so well. We were trained by the top, top people and we had the best, best education. We joined uh, at a place called 68 Air School at that point in time. And it's now known as the School for Logistics Training. Uh, we did basic workshop training um, at a place called BTC, uh, Basic Technical Co uh, College, and where we were taught how to weld, uh, do sheet metal work, uh, do machine work with lathes, and uh, all the other interesting articles as well. Directly after that, um, we actually started with a school block. Now, the National Technical Certificates, you could actually go right through and earn yourself a diploma, which is equivalent to a degree. And that's six, six, course, uh, six blocks of uh, trading. You've got a, got a number of uh, 12 subjects that you've got to follow through. And uh, to my amazement, I was starting to enjoy math. I got distinctions and after distinction, I was so surprised. I thought, oh, where did these brain cells come from all of a sudden? But it was enjoyable. I did very well at, at uh, Tech Blocks. And my apprenticeship continued. I ended up at a place called One Air Depot. And I think you spoke to Loris Besson the other day. And he came a couple of years after me. But One Air Depot is probably, was at that point, the most... Uh, 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 advanced Air Force uh, depot with respect to manufacturing, repair, and overall stores location. They had the biggest uh, central warehousing location in the Air Force. And it was really an interesting, interesting trip. I worked in the, the engine overall shop on the uh, big Griffin engines that were powering the Shackleton bombers at those times, or the uh, Shackleton uh, patrol aircraft. Um, I worked in the collaboration shop with uh, our famous Springbok rugby hooker, or Piston van Wijk. And then I spent time in the propeller shop, uh, working on the uh, transal and uh, C-130 propellers. That was really very interesting. And then I had the opportunity to actually assist with the overall and repair of uh, the Spitfire that was built up. And uh, that was quite interesting, working on that propeller. The moment that we finished our block at uh, One Air Depot, we're off to uh, another school block again. And uh, the school block was down in, in Cape Town at Maitland Technical College. Um, we had, a, had to do a minimum of three school blocks, which would take us to NTC3, National Technical Certificate 3. And um, after which we were posted out to a squadron to go and become um, seasoned apprentices. So in other words, you don't just do all the dirty sweep work now, you can actually touch something as well. <laughs> so we ended up at uh, uh, the uh, uh, flight training school at uh, Donata near Nigel. And uh, this was quite amazing. Um, there were a huge amount of aircraft the old Harvards, and uh, to be able to work on these aircraft was really, really interesting. Um, you, you went right back to basics in aviation, and uh, I mean, to drain the oil on the Harvard was the most interesting situation. The filter was right up between the uh, cylinders at the front. You remove the big ring cowlings, and then you've got to stick this long socket wrench all the way up to the top, loosen the filter plug, and the next minute, you and the engine are covered in oil as it all comes pouring out. <laughs> Interesting days. But uh, very soon, our apprenticeship was finished. And we had to go back uh, to do um, our last training with respect to the technical aspects of being an uh, aviation maintenance engineer in the South African Air Force. And we were uh, at that point in time assigned the top students would be given a choice of of uh, best squadrons etc and we were very fortunate i was really really fortunate for the fact that 
um, I've been doing so well in all my blocks and uh, the studies that uh, I was offered the opportunity to join one and three squadron at Air Force Base uh, Waterkloof. At that point, uh, the F-1 Mirage had just been introduced into the South African Air Force brand new aircraft. And I was very fortunate to be able to join the squadron and uh, learn to know this aircraft. So I did my final apprenticeship training, strapping a um, lot of our famous uh, chiefs of the Air Force into their seats in the F-1 Mirage and uh, also doing the maintenance on these. Interesting little story. You know, one of the inspections is to climb into the back of the uh, jet pipe of the F-1 Mirage and you've got these huge afterburner rings that you've got to check out. So you've got your little torch, you know, flashlight, and then you're busy checking the burner rings. And there's uh, one of the qualified men sitting in the front there does a dummy start with the uh, the the, uh, the uh, electric start, a little gas turbine engine. If you cut the fuel, you just have the, the, the dummy start going. I tell you, I came out of that jet pipe like a freaking rocket. <laughs> Anyway, the next thing that we, that we uh, had to do now is qualify as uh, aircraft maintenance engineers, which I duly did. And uh, we were then um, afforded to go back to our squadrons and now act as Omana, old men in the situation. So I'm at the squadron now, I'm a fully qualified corporal aircraft maintenance engineer. And uh, I'm thinking to myself, geez, you know, I joined to fly. Why am I sitting here? And I went walking past uh, 12 squadron where the buccaneers were. And there was a, a sergeant there, a very good friend of mine at the point. And I walked up to him and I said to him, oh, geez, you know, this is um, what you, you know, when are you going to do flight engineers course? I said, what? He says, flight engineers course. I said, where's the signal? He says, go to the duty room and just ask for the flight engineer's course. There's a signal that came out last week. Man, I was down at, uh, at the duty room like, like freaking Speedy Gonzalez. I mean, even Flash Gordon wouldn't catch me. I found the signal and then I had to go to the office and uh, go and write out the signal. You got this, this uh, uh, application form that you're going to do. It's, it's called a, a, um, a, I can't even remember the right wording, but you had to write this to your office of commanding, requesting permission to be able to apply for this course. You've got to quote the signal name, et cetera, et cetera. And you've got to write neat because the sergeant majors in the Air Force are the ones that scrutinize this and they've got to approve it. And then they'll send it to the office of commanding. And if he doesn't like it, you're going to write that thing over 10 times if he feels like it. So I wrote in my best handwriting, gave it into my sergeant major who looked it over and said to me, that's very good. I'm looking forward to seeing you go. I'll take care of this. And I forgot about it. And a couple of months later, still walking down there and I get summoned to the office of commanding's office. So I go smartly marching in there. Slam, slam my foot down to attention, throw up a beautiful salute that even I was proud of. And the OC looked at me and he said to me, Corporal Kutsia, congratulations, you've been approved for flight engineer training. Um, here's your signal. Man, I tell you, I was smiling from year to year. Grabbed the uh, authorization signal and uh, immediately ran off to go and get all the things sorted. I had to now go and do a flying medical at the uh, Military Medical Institute, uh, which was at Fuertracker Wucht in those days. Went through to uh, MMI and uh, did all the full flying medical stuff, the air nose, throw it to ECG, the jumping up and down, running around in circles and having me probed from left and right, opening all the freaking cavities and things and really giving you the once over. Fortunately, I passed <laughs> and uh, they immediately cleared me for uh, flight engineer training. Now, uh, flight engineer training was being completed at uh, 
87 um, advanced flight training school in uh, Bloomspreit, which is in Bloemfontein. And uh, I had to obviously get myself there and start our training all over. Well, we ended up in um, Air Force Base Bloomspreit in, uh, in winter, <laughs> as per normal. And uh, a, chat, a very good friend of mine, Ian Nicholson, I remember correctly. Yes, Ian Nicholson and I still travel together. I, I just bought myself a little Citroen 1220 Club. I was so proud of my little car. Anyway, we drove down to uh, Bloomsbright and we cleared in there. Now, clearing in into the Air Force means that you have a a certificate that's got a whole lot of areas that you've got to go to. You've got to go to the duty room. From the duty room, you've got to go to the, the Q store. From the Q store, then you've got to go to the mess. And then you've got to go to the to the squadron, to the sergeant major. And then you've got to go yeah. Then you've got to go there. And you've got to go to the toilet. And you've got to go, <laughs> so you've got to go all over. And everyone's got to sign your clearing in for. So we cleared in at Air Force Base Bloomsbrat. And immediately, basics all over again. Because you are now a roof, a beginner, an apprentice flight engineer. And the, the, the terminology used is UT, under training flight engineer. So you're not called a flight engineer or a troop or anything like that. You're a UT. <laughs> so you have to get, into, get on parade in the mornings. You've got to have an inspection. Um, you've got to do your two comma fours. You've got to run here, run there. And you've got to behave like a, a real little basic training monkey again. Anyway, the uh, the first phase of flight engineer training is all the books, know the aircraft. It's like converting from one aircraft type to another. So you've got to learn the basics of the airframe, the engines, the instrumentation, the uh, the uh, uh, rotary system, the gearboxes and all that type of stuff. And uh, quite interesting because uh, coming from a, from a fighter aircraft to a helicopter was uh, another, another opportunity again. Once the, uh, the technical training had been completed, you're now introduced into the flying phase. A lot more lectures again. And then you fly as a under training flight engineer with a qualified flight engineer. Um, at the same time, the, the uh, 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 squadron also does pilot training. So their course starts the same time as us. And their conversion to helicopters is the same length of period as what the flight engineer's training would be. So you're actually learning together. But, uh, I mean, just before you, you could uh, think that it's starting all over again, we're actually coming in towards the end. I have to tell you a very interesting story. You know, Ian Nicholson, when he looks at this, is going to giggle as well. Him and I um, take the long road in my little Citroen coming back to Bloomsbrook after a weekend in, uh, in, the, in the Highfelt. And uh, I pick him up in Johannesburg. And I don't know if you remember those old Coleman coolers, big round Coleman coolers used to open up the top and then you put all your stuff in, you put your ice in and then you close it up. It's got a little tap at the bottom. And uh, we're halfway to Bloomsbrat and uh, Ian whips open the Coleman cooler, which was still full of ice at that stage, takes the bottle of brandy, puts it in and takes two liters of Coke, adds that in. And we had ourselves a little feast all the way back to Bloomsbrat. Then we got to Bloomsbrake and he says, oh, there's a friend of mine that's got a party on tonight. Let's pop in over there. So till the wee hours of the morning, Ian and I were celebrating and dancing and jumping around and misbehaving. So needless to say, the next morning when we got to Bloomsbrake, we looked a little bit the worse for wear. So we fall in on the parade ground. They come and do the inspection. And the one instructor stands in front of me like this and he's looking at me, he says, are you still drunk? No flight. <laughs> he says, you're lying. Okay, you and you, Mr. Nicholson, grab those Alouette aircraft jacks 
and do a circuit. Now, another way, Jack is quite an uncomfortable animal to carry. It's very heavy. And after 200 meters of running around the, the um, aircraft pads there, uh, you're a little bit the worst from way. And they have a bubble loss on top of that. <laughs> you don't look well at all. Needless to say, that was the beginning of our punishment. The second phase of our punishment was you and you, Mr. Nicholson, Mr. Kutia, come here. You guys will be doing three hours of cargo slinging today. Okay. All right, climbing. Three hours of cargo slinging means you've got to lie in your gut and you've got to look outside. And you've got to patter the pilot to position cargo, cargoes, uh, the cargo slung load to a position that he wants to put it down. And uh, we had to do very heavy uh, loads, long poles, and you've got to do precision pattering to bring that pole into a position. Needless to say, you can't say, hang on, I'm not feeling well. Uh, just give me a second, you know. You have to talk all the time. Needless to say, we're coming in with this long pole, and there's a tractor tire that I've got to plant this pole in, and everything's going perfectly. When all of a sudden, my gut says, uh-uh, I don't like this stuff that you fed me. And I heave the huge, the huge amount of puke up that you could ever believe in your life. I just whip the microphone away and I belch the slot out because I'm looking outside the aircraft. And wham, all of a sudden I'm blind. I mean, what the heck? Oh, it's caught all over my blooming helmet. <laughs> Fine, but I had, the, I had the visor down. So I just lifted the visor up and I can see you again. Microphone back in, carry on with the patter, put the pole in pick it up, fly it off, do another approach, and I feel, ooh, hoo, hoo. it's not finished yet. So back with the microphone, empty the, empty the gut, boom, and I'm blind again. Ooh, hang on, let me take my glasses off. Oh, I can see again. <laughs> so it was uh, a very interesting three hours. Needless to say, Ian and I never, ever drank before a sortie again. <laughs> and, uh, we, we started applying the rules of don't drink eight hours before flying and don't smoke within 30 meters of an aircraft. We changed it the other way around. Don't uh, smoke eight hours before and drink 30 meters from an aircraft. Anyway, um, eventually our training is coming to an end and it's in summer and the chief of the Air Force is going to award our flight engineers wings. This thing that I still wear very proudly today. So needless to say, we've got the squadron marching up and we're getting ready to get our awarded, our awards, our flight engineer wings. And a good friend of mine, Manik, is Vulcan. Don't call him Wilkin. He will be very upset. It's Vulcan. <laughs> so Manik is Vulcan, goes to the toilet quickly before we fall in. And the next minute, I just see dust and stones flying all over the place and like he fell on his hands and feet, and within two seconds, he was back up again, wiping his hands, getting the dust sorted out. He tripped and fell in the dirt, <laughs> got back up, fall in, fell in line, and uh, we proceeded to, to the parade. Marched up smartly, got our wings, very, honor, very, very, very proud moment for, for all of us. And... Uh, we were the second course at Bloomsbrat. The first course was from um, the, 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 year, the beginning of the year to the middle of the year, and we were the second course at Bloomsbrat. They just recently moved up from Cape Town at that point in time. Very, very proud of ourselves. And uh, straight off the parade, old uh, Flight Sergeant Michael Webb, who was the Chief uh, Flight Engineer Instructor, very He's a gentleman, true gentleman, old Michael. I still keep contact with him to, to this day. Really, really like the man. He uh, marches us up and he says, gentlemen, I'd like to inform of your postings. 
and uh, starts handing out all the postings to everybody. He says, Mr. Katsia, Mr. Nicholson, uh, you're off to 22 Squadron, Cape Town. So we we're very excited, you know, we planned this thing. And uh, Ian and I agree that we're going to be traveling together in my little uh, Citroen to Cape Town. Now, the planning for this, I went back home, uh, got all my stuff packed, had a bit of rest, uh, rest and recuperation, um, arranged to pick up Ian in Johannesburg, and then uh, we started our trek down to Cape Town. It was an uh, interesting drive. Those days there was um, um, fuel restrictions. You couldn't buy fuel after uh, five o'clock in the evenings or six, no, six o'clock in the evenings, if I remember correctly. And uh, the little Citroen only had a 40 liter tank. So you, it was a very, very uh, fuel efficient vehicle. And uh, when we left Johannesburg that uh, early, uh, early that morning, I made sure we were totally, totally filled up to the brim. And then we raced as fast as we could down to Bloomsprate from there, because we wanted to make sure we get to uh, the last filling station at Three Sisters by six o'clock, so that we could at least have enough fuel to make it to Cape Town. Three Sisters give or take about the halfway, halfway mark. And uh, we, we made it by the, by, the, <laughs> by the skin of our butts, I tell you. Got to Three Sisters, refueled, and what I did is I held my hand in front of the, 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 the filler cap, filled it up until it was running up against my hand, and then just quickly slapped the, the fuel cap on on top of it to get some extra fuel. We drove through the most interesting parts, first time I've ever driven this part of the country, and it was amazing going through the Free State, then the Great Karoo, then the Small Karoo. And eventually, in the distance, we start seeing Cape Town. I mean, quite a thrill. We arrived at uh, Air Force Base Astorplatte and was got ourselves settled for the night. It was a Sunday. And then uh, early the Monday morning, we reported to the duty room, got our clearing in form sorted out, and uh, marched off to 22 Squadron, where we met the guys for the first time. Now, 22 Squadron was uh, a pretty elite squadron. They were the only squadron that actually, in fact, worked with the Navy at that point in time. And they were um, operating the Westland Wasp helicopters. I mean, it, what a weird-looking helicopter. But amazing, really amazing, a British-type designed aircraft. And uh, we cleared in, immediately uh, got ourselves settled. And they were told that we're going to be taking charge of the two Alouette helicopters that were transferred into the squadron now. So we've just qualified on Alouette, so obviously we'll know what's, what's going on with them. Um, sat down, chatted to the guys, and uh, then found out that 22 Squadron do, does not do operational tours. At that point in time, we were doing, or well, the Air Force was supporting uh, the Rhodesian War as well as doing tours up in uh, Southwest Africa, or today as known as Namibia. And uh, Ian and I were both very disappointed. Uh, we were looking forward to getting into the action. And uh, Ian actually uh, was approached by court helicopters at that point in time, and uh, decided that uh, this, this wasn't for him. And he joined court helicopters bought himself out of the Air Force. We had to pay to get out of the Air Force those days. And uh, he was off to Argentina. And I never saw him for many, many years thereafter. I plugged through. I actually uh, immediately was put onto a, a diving course at the, uh, uh, the Navy at Simonstown. And uh, with a, a, a group of... Uh, a, other, other chaps as well, because as a maritime squadron, you have to do a SC rescue standby. So you are a flight engineer if you're on a flight engineer standby, and then you're off for a week, and then you're a diver standby, rescue swimmer. So we got to Simonstown, reported to go and do our diving course, and uh, 
the Navy looks down at you like, aha, here's some more ducks that we could drown for a change. And uh, we give you a couple of lectures about how to rescue people, how to do this, how to breathe underwater, how to do that, how to do the following, and blah, 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 blah. Next minute, the guy turns on and he says, okay, get dressed. You're off to the rock for a swim. Now, what rock? <laughs> you know, we, we, we've got our kit, so we got to jump into our wetsuits. And uh, a couple of the guys are battling and giggling, you know, it's all the joke. We go down to the rock and uh, the other guys come waddling along at their own given time. And the guy says, see that rock in the water? It's about 500 meters out. Okay. Off to the rock and back. Okay. So best way to do that is snorkel on, goggles on, snorkel on, flippers on, hands behind your back, settle in for the long run and off you go. And we're swimming off to the rock, come back, boom, 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 boom. Everything is going good. Now get overtaken by the late Kenny Dalglish. A sad story, which I'll mention later on again. Get to the end of our swim, and the guy says, that's the first of five. Back you go. <laughs> anyway, we complete five laps, get out pretty exhausted. Obviously, the Navy is enjoying this. <laughs> So the guest says, look, for your tardiness, you got an extra four laps. For every time that any one of you is late, when we tell you you've got 10 minutes to prepare, we'll add a lap on. It was the last of the extra laps. <laughs> so diving course ended up pretty well. Um, the interesting part was jumping off the flight deck of the SAS Tafelberg, which was in harbor at that time. Now the Tafelberg's deck, flight deck, is around about 70 foot from the water. And uh, when you step off and you look forward, you're going to land flat on your face. If you're going to try and look up to see how far you're falling, you're going to fall flat on your back. So you have to ensure that you keep your eyes on the horizon. Always keep your arms close to you. Otherwise, you'll lose an arm. It'll break off. <laughs> and if you hit the water cleanly, you go down pretty deep. But with the wetsuit on, your buoyancy, you come out come up pretty quickly. That was concluded. Enjoyed that immensely. I actually wanted to jump again. They said, not once is enough, off you go. Then they brought in a Westland Wasp. Now you've got to learn to jump out of the aircraft because part of your rescue um, uh, swimmer process is to be able to jump out of a helicopter, swim to your, uh, uh, your uh, rescue that you're going to be pulling out of the water, grabbing them correctly, putting a strop around them so that they can be hoisted out. So jump from a wasp is at 50 foot, jump out of the wasp, and you're going to do two or three jumps before you qualify now. So the second jump, I tapped on Andy, um, uh, Andy Pendlebury on the shoulder. I said, hey, hey, ask him if we can go to 100 foot. The pilot's smiling, look, big fears is I'm going to throw this boy out. <laughs> so he takes it up to 100 foot, and uh, I step out of the aircraft, focus on the horizon, arm is now on my side, and I'm falling and falling. And I tell you, and I'm falling. And I just want to look down and say, no, don't look down. Don't look down. And I'm falling and I'm falling. And the next minute I hit that water beautifully clean. And I go down, down, down. And I think, that's right. I'll come up now. And I realized, hey, you better start swimming, pal. You're running out of breath. <laughs> Swam up to the surface, popped out, and everybody was thumbs up. It, that was very nice. Good, so diving, diving course completed. Now I'm a qualified rescue swimmer and my work at the squadron starts. At this stage, it was, uh, my main focus was to qualify on the Westland Wasp. I spent as much time as I can learning what I could, then got onto a, a conversion course, completed that. And uh, pretty soon I was uh, an under training flight engineer on Westland Wasps. <laughs> You just do a conversion flight or two, um, more emergency quizzes than anything else, which is really, you know, once again, the Air Force training was impeccable, absolutely impeccable. Uh, the safety standards were, were very high and the quality was top of the world, top of the notch. I qualified out in the Westland Wasp and um, 
it was time for me to take vacation and go and see the, the family again. I ate the long road up, and uh, one of my ex-squadron friends from one and three squadron, Nico Bietz, um, met up with me, says to me, Steve, what are you doing? I said, no, I'm down, down at 22 squadron in Plot. He says, you should come, you should come work for us. I said, why? He says, no, well, this is what I'm earning. And I looked at him and said, what? He said, yeah. He said, what are you earning? I said, well, I'm a qualified flight engineer. I get an engineer's allowance. Then I'm a qualified diver, so I get a diver's allowance. And then I'm a aircraft maintenance engineer as well. So what are you earning? Oh, I've got 375 rand a month. He said, okay. <laughs> okay. Right, here's my salary. And I'm not going to talk about it because... At that point in time, it was a very big decision for me. Um, I thought about it for a long and hard time, got back to Cape Town, and uh, you still treat it as an outsider from the squadron because they're a very elite group and you've got to, you've got to qualify to be part of them type of thing. And uh, it, was, it was going a bit... Uh, um, sticky things weren't really all that fantastic and i decided to to pull the plug and i had followed ian and bought myself out of the air force returned to uh to germiston actually uh, at fields aviation and started working as an aircraft maintenance engineer at fields aviation this was uh okay it was um 1979, and uh, at this point in time, for me to qualify as a civilian aircraft maintenance engineer, I just needed to write the ANC license uh, with um, uh, with the transport services people. Um, I started studying, and I thought, well, let's see how it goes. I was working long hours, earning a lot of overtime making quite a lot of money, growing my head right down to the middle of my back, looking like a proper hippie. <laughs> and uh, I was driving home. I was uh, renting a, a, a bedroom from one of my mother's friends. We used to know her as Tani Rasi. <laughs> anyway, Auntie Rasi really looked after me well. And I was driving past the Brackpan airfield. And I thought, hmm, popped in inquired about uh, flight training and uh, Sluggy was the instructor. He's just uh, moonlights as a flight instructor. He's a, he was actually a, a 747 uh, captain at that point in time. And he said to me, look, I'll take you up right now. Let's have a go. I said, fine. <laughs> I walked out to the aircraft and uh, he says to me, uh, so what's your experience? I said, no, I'm, I'm an ex-flight engineer in the Air Force. He says, oh, okay, do a, do a pre-flight. So I walked around the little aircraft, did a pre-flight as I anticipated it should be done. He corrected me on one or two of the items. He says, okay, fine, get into the left seat. So I jump into the left seat. He gets into the right seat, little Piper 140, a little low-wing aircraft. And uh, he says, yes, the checklist. Read through it and see if you can follow it. So I've got to look around and try and find most of the stuff, but Brooks scare up, I get through it piece by piece. And uh, eventually uh, fire up the aircraft and he shows me how to be able to steer the thing. And he says, okay, taxi out to the runway, please. So I taxi out to the, to the runway. He says, can you do radio procedures? I said, yeah, I'm pretty proficient. He says, okay, cool. Now you've got to tell the local traffic that you're actually just going to be uh, flying in the circuit here, yeah? and um, then I'll take over from there. Oh, okay. So I do a radio call, a general radio call about what we're going to attempt to do. And uh, the sluggy says to me, okay, fine. Now power up and check the magnetos. I said, okay, well, how do you do that? He said, we'll take it up to set RPM, and then you must uh, check left mag, both, right mag, both. You're not allowed to get more than a 50 RPM drop. Okay, so I'll push it up, check the mags. Everything looks fine to me. He says to me, okay, good. All right, now he said, now I'll take the aircraft. 
And he takes the aircraft and he gets her lined up and he says, okay, fine. Now, advance the throttle, put your hands and feet on. So advance the throttle, get her up, and he says, okay, you got. <laughs> and at 50 knots, I've got the control column and I start pulling her back, pulling her back. And at 60 knots, she lifts off the ground and off we go. What a feeling. <laughs> what a feeling. He says to me, uh, Steve, it's not too bad. He then proceeds to show me um, what I'm going to be doing. So I needed to be able to do a stall. I needed to be able to And uh, I needed to be able to take off and landings and uh, navigation. And he spoke me through most of the stuff. And he said, but the most important thing is we've got to get you a radio license first. So take this book and study for it. Um, and he said to you, by the way, I think you're going to be you're going to be solo in about five hours. I said, what? He says, yeah, no, we'll, 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 make a, we'll make a plan. And true to his word, five hours later, I was, I was solo. <laughs> and that was pretty impressive. I was very really happy about that. And that's how my, I got back into the flying business. Anyway, I was uh, back at, uh, at work, and uh, there was an advert for, uh, for South African Airways flight engineers. So I said, oh, um, I'm a flight engineer there, so I'm damn sure I can do that. And uh, I applied. And uh, I waited a couple of weeks and nothing really came about it. And all of a sudden, I got a phone call. I'm shortlisted. I must come in for an interview. So I thought, okay, good. Let's see what happens. And uh, got into work the one morning. I was about to go and speak to... Uh, my supervisor and tell him, listen, I've got to take the day off. Uh, I won't be in tomorrow. And uh, <clears throat> lo and behold, there's an old Sergeant Major from the Air Force, Sergeant Major Rivers, because they had uh, a stores location there because we were working on uh, on on um, the Dakotas, Harvards, and uh, Skymasters and Viscounts and stuff. So they got a store there with all, all the Air Force parts. And uh, I'm okay, I said, Samir, what are you doing here? He says to me, Steve, my word, of you of all people, what are you doing here? So I said, no, I'm working at Fields. He says, no, man, no, man, no, man. He says, why don't you come back to the Air Force? So I said, I wasn't really happy about 22 squad. It's a beautiful squadron, lovely people, but it's a click. And uh, they don't do bush tours. He says, no, no, don't worry. I can get you to Bloomsbrad. Will that be okay? And they do lots of tours. So I said, um, okay, let's mark a plan. <laughs> let's make a plan. Let's get this thing done. I then did the horrible duty of picking up the phone and phoning South African Airways and telling them thank you, but no thank you. And uh, honestly, you know, I am not sad. I've, my Air Force career has, was probably the best, best and worst moments of my life. You always reward yourself with the best episodes after the worst has happened anyway. Because uh, you've got one life, you better enjoy it every second that you can. So here we are, 1980, and I have to do basics once more, <laughs> called Air Force Conversion. And I do this at uh, the dreaded... Um, what is that place called now again, <laughs> where, they, where they killed all the troopies? Um, Foot Tracker Wuchter, we, we ended up over there at the Air Force Gymnasium, where we now have to be taught again how to throw weapons around and stamp our feet and smile. Uh, at this point in time, I had uh, grown a beard. And uh, by hook or by crook, I managed to have a beard pass, because you needed to have a beard pass. And uh, the doctor had said, oh, you got psychosis barbia. So I said, whatever it is, whatever it is, as long as it's not contagious. <laughs> he says, no, go grow your beard. So I joined the Air Force with a beard and uh, did my orientation. But in the process, while I was still in Jerviston, I'd met um, Zalilin Butis. And obviously, the next step is you've got to get married and so on. And uh, when 
I was posted back to Bloomsbrad. I was afforded the opportunity to apply for a potluck. Now, a potluck <laughs> is not food, okay? A potluck is an old um, military billet that had been se separated by a fence. So you've got all these billets in a row at Bloomsbrad. Look, are now actually given to married couples, and they could go and create a home inside of these billets. So all you do is you break the holes between all the billet walls, and you've got different rooms. So you've got a kitchen, a bathroom, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So Zilla and I got married in uh, in uh, June, and we moved into our potluck, and I proceeded to break walls and put in doors and paint and build a little garage outside for the cars and start making a garden, et cetera, et cetera. And settled back into being a flight engineer back at 87, now called HFS, Helicopter Flight School. And uh, lo and behold, the te chief technical officer, Fluffy Dempus, a lieutenant at that point in time, an ex-flight engineer from uh, 22 Squadron, in fact, took me under his wing and he, he, he really, really taught me the basics of everything. Um, I, really, I really enjoyed working with Fluffy at that point. Needless to say, um, it wasn't very long. Um, by the end of, October, by the, end of uh, the 80s, 1980s, my first operational tour. And uh, we were doing all sorts of follow-ups um, with uh, uh, Kufut at that point in time. And I'm sure the audience will know what Kufut is, having listened to many stories. And um, the Rekis, the reconnaissance units. We did a lot of these cooker shop follow-ups and uh, quick call-outs and things uh, with these guys. Needless to say, um, my, my first situation was with, uh, with Mike Hill, a lieutenant at that stage in game. He was my pilot. And uh, we ended up having a, a, a first contact, as it were. And uh, he says to me, can you see them? The uh, terrorists were apparently lying there somewhere. I could see nothing. Um, I'm not, not bush oriented. I haven't been able to see these things. I don't know what to look for. And I've got the cannon cocked, got a 20 mil cannon, and I'm looking at this lot and I'm thinking, what the heck do I look at? What do I look at? And it's as if somebody had done a paint by numbers and just chuk, 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 there's the outline, they popped up, poof, straight away, it just saw them. And I tell you, within five minutes, it was over. That was just gone, poof. Um, we uh, obviously landed, had a debrief with, with the guys. And uh, everyone was uh, pretty impressed because these were terrorists that were infiltrating from Angola. And they were known as the special forces. And their purpose was to kidnap uh, the locals, take them back and train them. So it was a win-win for us at that day. And uh, also a line in the sand for me because I'd now become an operator. At that point, uh, we also uh, were deployed to the Marianne Flush. And uh, I'm trying to think how this actually took place. <laughs> uh, oh, yes, yes. Uh, Mike Hill and I again were deployed to the Marianne Flush uh, with a whole bunch of other we had uh, pumas, um, we had uh, four alouettes, and um, we arrived um, early morning to get started up and deploy to the Marianne Flush, which is on the western side of, uh, 
of uh, Southwest Africa or Namibia as you know it today. And it's just below the border with Angola. Um, amazing place. If you ever have the opportunity, just Google it. Beautiful place, the Marian Flus. It was early morning and uh, we started up. And as I looked up, I realized, oh, shucks, the blades had turned and my blooming, one of the main blades was over the jet pipe of the Alouette. Now, the Alouette had a exhaust that would vector up uh, to act with a Strela protection so we didn't have any heat distribution for, for heat seeking missiles and it burnt that blade. The blade, I tell you, immediately started bending. So everybody left except us. We had to do a blade change. So quickly the blade change, got in, and off we go to the Marian Flush after the blade change and the tracking and testing, etc. We get to uh, the Marian Flush and uh, we're going to deploy uh, the next morning. Colonel Ollie Holmes at that point in time, now General. Uh, Ollie still, uh, Holmes still briefed us that evening and he said to us, uh, chances are we're going to lose an aircraft tomorrow. These guys are well armed. They've got ACAC, they've got missiles, they've got everything. So this is how we're going to go in. You guys need to be wide awake when you go there. Needless to say, it was an interesting debrief for us and uh, interesting stories to tell about it. Um, early in the next morning, we all take off and we're flying into Iona where the contacts to take place. We were over the overhead target, I think not even 30 seconds, when all hell broke loose. I mean, the sounds that hit that aircraft were amazing. I immediately looked back and I couldn't see the tail boom. It was just fuel spewing. So I said to, to Mike at that point in time, you better land. So we broke away, we landed, I looked, jumped out, and what had happened is one of the bullets had hit the mainframe of the aircraft at the bottom and tumbled up all along the fuel tank. Um, what can I do? So I said to Mike, you go and lie on the, on the, the room there and I'm going to start looking at a mechanism how we can plug these holes so we can at least fly the aircraft out. Um, we radioed the Pumas, told them what was going on. They brought in a bunch of uh, uh, round protection for us. And um, I'm busy looking at the aircraft to see what I can do, what I've got in my kit. Now I had some soap, I had some sticks, etc., and I was going to plug it with this lot. And I look up and I see, here's this pilot <laughs> on the top of the hill with his helmet still on and his rifle. And he's looking over the top. So I scream at him, Mike! Mike, he says, what's it? I said, take your bloody bone dome off, you idiot. <laughs> oh, Mike just turns at me, looks at me like he takes his helmet off, puts it down, carries on holding God. <laughs> Fantastic. Anyway, so I eventually plugged the, uh, the hole up. Puma landed, put a round um, around, around protection around us, and uh, I've got a I got them to drop off a, a, a 44-gallon drum of fuel. I pumped the fuel in, and I saw we were still leaking, but it would afford us the opportunity to get back to the Marian Flush. So we started up, took off, headed back to the Flush, and uh, the next minute, four pumas come and protect the baby. <laughs> There's a the little Alouette gunship, and the four pumas right around us, looking after us. Eventually the one Puma commander radios Mike and he says, Mike, your aircraft is leaking fuel badly. So I looked back again and I said, there's nothing we can do. You know, obviously the soap plug that I put in, and I said, I'll just monitor the fuel gauge. If the fuel gauge goes low, then we land. Yeah. Well, we made it back to the flus, landed over there, 
And uh, the other guys were still fighting. I mean, they were all gone. Everyone was fighting like crazy. And uh, I'm standing, I, I didn't even see. I didn't even see a gook. I didn't even, I just heard shots and we were gone. So that's what I saw. <laughs> Repaired the, um, prepared all my stuff over there and uh, Ollie Holmes came out and said, is that aircraft safe to fly? So I said, no, sir, this uh, aircraft's buggered. Said the frame is shattered. It was, the bullet tumbled um, through the frame and then right up the side of the tank. There's no way I can, we can fly it out of here. He says, okay, that's all right. I've already ordered a, a transal to come and fetch us. So a C-160 transal was going to arrive, land in the desert um, at the Marian Flush. And they were going to pick us up and take us back. Anyway, so um, one thing led to another. We were sitting there waiting for everybody. And eventually, late the afternoon, the aircraft started coming back. And the guys were all talking about this huge contact that they had, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, Andre Geiser, one of the flight engineers that was with us, comes to me. He says to me, ah, yeah, you know, we also picked up a couple of bullets, et cetera, et cetera. And I said to him, oh, you're, you're okay? He says, yeah, yeah, no, what oh, was lacquer, man? I said, oh, okay. So we get to the, I'm busy helping him, you know, remove the panel so we can see anything was damaged. And he goes white in the face. And he comes out from under the aircraft and he looks, he says to me, yes, good. I said, what's wrong, Casey? He says, my aircraft, it, it's, it's, it's done. I said, I don't understand. He says, look at this. The, Collective pitch indicator, it's got a mixing unit where all the controls come in. Now, the collective is the main power lever for the controls on, uh, on the LOA. The um, bearing and the housing around which the collective pitch rod had been located had been shot off, and it was held on just by a little thread of metal. And they'd flown that whole sortie with that thing in. Well, Casey was white as a sheet, I tell you. Anyway, so now we've got two aircraft that we're going to load into the transal. So we prepare that we drain the fuel, we get the things ready. The transal comes in, back the two aircraft into the transal. And we're all bundled up into the aircraft. Now we're going back to Ondangwa with the two broken aircraft. Uh, so it's Mike Hill, myself, Andre Geyser, and, uh, and his pilot as well. And uh, we take off from the Marian Flush, heading back to Ondangwa. It's dusk, um, becoming night, and uh, we start with a propi. Now, you know what propi is, is you take a cap of a, of a whiskey bottle, and then you pour a drop, and each one has their propi, and eventually the bottle's empty. And uh, <laughs> old Casey's pilot jumps up, and he says, I, I just shat in my pants. So all of us just bomb shot, boom. Mike Hill, my pilot, jumps into the aircraft and locks the door. I jump on the other side of the other aircraft because the two aircraft are standing tail to tail in the tonsil now. And our Casey runs to the front of the cockpit <laughs> to go and get a bog roll, a roll of toilet paper. And uh, <laughs> his pilot is in the, in the, the curtained off toilet of the transal. And Casey chucks him uh, the bog roll and he wipes himself clean and gets some water and wipes himself off. Now his overall, his flight suit is all covered in crap. So he takes this and he puts it in a bag and he says, has anybody got a, a pair of shorts or something for me? Now, <laughs> this guy is a bit taller than me and a bit bigger than me. And uh, I offer him a pair of my little running shorts. And he comes out there with this small pair of shorts on and his fellies, that's all he's got on. And he's got his bag of crap. <laughs> anyway, we landed uh, at Air Force Base on Dangwa. And uh, the transal drops its ramp and the whole of Ondangwa, all the married quarters, all the children, the women and, the, and everybody that could is standing there to see about these two alouettes that were shot down now. And out comes 
Casey's pilot with his bag of crap, his shorts, he's standing at the top there. <laughs> I mean, you, you had to you had to witness it to, to experience it. It was quite an amazing situation. Anyway, that was my first bush tour. So first contact and then also first shoot down. Alouette was uh, sent back to South Africa for rebuild and repair. The frame was uh, damaged and could not be repaired. Next, um, started a flurry of operations for me. Um, at that point in time, the war had been escalating in, uh, in Namibia and Angola. We were getting a lot of infiltration, special forces coming over from Swapu and uh, we were constantly busy, constantly busy, a lot of action. Um, we um, had lots of uh, opportunities to operate with some of the best in the world. Um, I was very fortunate to be involved with Kufut a lot. Um, most of our follow-up operations were done with Kufut and with the reconnaissance unit, four Ricky, five Ricky, one Ricky, those guys. Absolute pleasure to operate with such professional soldiers. And the most, the most important operations that I really, really enjoyed was with um, 3-2 Battalion, the black troops of 3-2 Battalion. I've still got some very good friends amongst them today. And really, they were like brothers to us. Um, they loved us because we protected them. <laughs> and we loved them because it was, always, it was always a pleasure working with them. Very good to operate with those guys. I enjoyed immensely working with Kufut, but made very good friends uh, with Kufut. Um, some of the guys I've kept as friends for years after, until I left South Africa, actually. Um, the one situation that, that I remember very clearly, we were operating out of Yanhana, which is right on the border between Angola and uh, Southwest Africa, known as Namibia today. And uh, I was operating with uh, Neil Ellis, and I'm going to refer to Neil Ellis as Nellis from now on because that's what we call him. And uh, the three two battalion guys had just come out of the bush. Now we operate with them, so we know them. We know them well. Uh, Lieutenant, the late Lieutenant Jim Savory, uh, was in charge of the battalion, and he came marching into the pub. And uh, the officer commanding was a major of um, Ilhana at that point in time. Um, banned them from coming into the camp. He said, you guys couldn't sleep on the end of the runway. Um, Nellis obviously also had a sense of humor failure and threatened that we would leave. Yeah, we're not going to stay at Yonhana that night. <laughs> Needless to say, um, it was not a very pleasant situation, but you had these clashes between uh, blue and brown and brown on brown, etc. The, the uh, the um, mechanized units didn't like the foot soldiers. The foot soldiers couldn't get on with these guys, etc. But that's that's the way the military is. At the end of the day, everyone's got each other's back, and uh, it was an interesting scenario. But we still drank it away. <laughs> Ended up in a good situations. Um, I was doing quite a number of tours, um, and uh, I would do anything up to six six tours a year, um, which is quite, quite an amount those days. It does put a lot of strain on a person's marriage. And, uh, you know, there's always bad that comes with good, but you always make the best of a bad thing anyway. Um, back in uh, the country, uh, we actually had uh, the, in, in 81, June of 81, we had the... Um, Republic celebrations, uh, South African Republic celebrations, and uh, 20 years of being a republic. So we took uh, four alouettes and went to all the towns in the Free State, the Orange Free State. And we did what we called the dancing alouettes and put up shows for the people at all these towns. So we would have uh, four, four aircraft doing uh, a little dance around in a group 
all the time. And we ended up in the one little dorpy, or <laughs> little town, um, and uh, we ran out of fuel. We were low on fuel. So we landed at the local co-op and uh, got some uh, lamp oil, paraffin. We filled up the aircraft with these things. <laughs> because as an emergency fuel, you can use paraffin. And uh, we flew back to base with that. Interesting stories. Lovely to meet the farmers, work with them. Really is. Then uh, it was early 81. Um, I was assigned a tour at Rondangwa again. And uh, Arthur Walker and myself, the late Arthur Walker and, and myself, were um, uh, operating in Angola. In fact, uh, it was uh, Operations uh, um, Coronation, Daisy, and Pritia and Mirbos. So it was a lot of operations. And I, I came back for each and every one of those operations. And the one operation I went in with, uh, with Arthur, we went to Zangongo. And we established a heli admin group, a HAG, um, just, just uh, to the south, uh, uh, west, southeast of, uh, of uh, Zangongo. Um, in a, and and um, we had, um, I think there were up to six Pumas and six Alouettes, the gunships. And we all landed in this area that we were going to establish as a hag. And we were walking around. It was called the, uh, the garage because this is where the Swapo troops had made their uh, a little makeshift garage to repair all their vehicles and things. And I had my um, AK-47 slung over my shoulder. I ref prefer to carry that because if you get shot down, you're not going to find any R4 bullets anywhere <laughs> or R5 bullets. So... 5.56, 5.5 versus 7.62, you're going to find plenty of them on the ground. Okay. So I carried an AK-47, got it slung over my shoulder, my CZ-45 CZ, um, uh, uh, that I had, it uh, carried uh, 16 with one up the snout. So I'm pretty well protected. So we're walking around the garage, and the next minute, this brown job, <laughs> major uh, army major screams, Get those choppers in the air! <laughs> Screaming on the top of his voice. And you just see freaking pumas and alouettes starting up and taking off. That we all come belting up and getting. I mean, I was still putting in the barrel when when Arthur was even not he didn't even have his straps tied up. He says to me, get in, get in. <laughs> I jump in, grab the cannon, jumped in, and he took up a handful of power and off we went. And as we take off, we're busy flying away just to get into a circuit around this place now, because obviously they've seen something and we need to shoot with my shoot. And I look back like that, and there's a flight engineer standing on the ground with a wheel chock in his hand, and his pilot had taken off, was flying off. <laughs> he obviously got halfway through the circuit and was talking to nobody, looked back, saw the, the flight engineer is not there, looked down, saw him on the ground, and came in sheepishly and landed and picked him up. <laughs> so that was hysterical. Anyway, we came, eventually the Pongo uh, Major um, uh, radioed us back and said, no, it's all clear, you guys can come in and land. So we go and land back on the spot where we were, and uh, there on the ground is a, is a swap with terrorist, and next to him is a Dragunov sniper's rifle. So Arthur, Arthur goes up to the Major and he says to him, what, 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 what's the story? He says, no. Listen to what this guy's going to say. And he, he speaks in a broken English. Yeah, pretty good. He says, what, what, what's going on? He says, no, I recognize you with a beard. I recognize you. You and you, points to Arthur. He says, yeah, I, I saw you. He was sitting in the tree above us with his rifle. And uh, the decision that he made at that point in time was to rather surrender but he could have taken us both out. Um, those were the situations that the guys were facing on a daily basis. Needless to say, on the same tour, I ended up with uh, Commandant Hartzenberg, who was the officer commanding of uh, 17 Squadron in Pretoria at that time, Air Force Base SWAT Corps. And uh, his nickname was Lucifer. 
I'm not going to elude too much on that. If he does hear this, I apologize, sir. <laughs> anyway, um, Arthur and uh, Wachi, my book, also a very good friend of mine, were in the other gunship, and we were uh, flying second, uh, second man to them. Arthur was leading the, the, the two of us out, and uh, we were off to the Hague, um, landed at the Hague, got debriefed and said, oh, guys are eating contact, flat-footed, go and get them, you know. So there were troops out in, the, this is in Angola, the southern part of Angola, they hit a contact and they needed air support immediately. So we jump into the aircraft, start up, and we're heading across, and there's these uh, big shaunas. Now, a shauna is a big open clear area of, of uh, a, a pond of water in, during the rainy season, and during the dry season, it's just this dry, smooth sand. So we come down low over the shauna, and as we pitch down over the shauna, we get hit. But I tell you, it sounded like freaking like ricochets all over the place. I mean, I'm spitting out stuff out of my mouth. The Alouette floor has got a filler called Multiprene. I'm just spitting this stuff out. I thought, what the heck is going on? And I look to the right and I said, come on, are you okay? Are you okay? Come on, are you okay? And he's dead silent, dead silent. So what we did often is we would, we would sit next to the pilot. There's this there's the panel between uh, the, the, the uh, ammo box and the pilot. We'd sit on our knees over there, grab the, the controls, and then fly the aircraft like that. We practiced that because if there's an opportunity uh, that the pilot does get shot, you can at least then fire away and do a landing somewhere so that you can get to safety. So I jump in there between the ammo pan and I about to grab it, and then he shook out of it. He was in shock. So I said to him, are you okay, Commandant? He says, yes, I think I've been shot. So I said to him, where? So he pulls up his hand, and there was a, a ricochet that had just trimmed his thumb. It just nicked him. No blood, nothing, just a, just a bruise. So I said to him, and it had gone out the window. So obviously it comes through, through the floor. So we land, both aircraft, we were away from the area. And uh, both aircraft had picked up a lot of bullets. Um, the aircraft, the superficial damage to the airframes of the aircraft, but the blades, both aircraft had holes in the blades. Fortunately, if you, if you put a hole through the back end of the blade, in other words, not the, the leading edge, then you don't really uh, affect the integrity of the, or the strength of the blade itself. So we got airborne again, and we had to go back to Air Force Base on Dongwa. We'd actually flown over a huge battalion of Swapo, <laughs> and they were lying on the opposite side of the Shona waiting for us. And needless to say, they got us. We got back and uh, we repaired both aircraft. Took a couple of days, we had to change the blades, um, do the blade tracking, get them, get them sorted out again, etc. Anyway, that was, that was an interesting tour again. Then uh, we also, on the next operation, we were deployed um, in Operation Carnation, actually. We were deployed um, just um, very close to, to Zangongo. And uh, I remember this distinctly. The guys had told us, listen, uh, you guys better dig in because they're throwing mortars. So dig, uh, dig yourself some, some trenches so you can sleep in them because, you know, it's, it's not very safe here. So we, the ground is hard, I tell you, but we dig deep enough trenches. So we've all got stretchers. So we take a stretcher and you lie it down and you take the legs out. So at least you've got, got something between you and the cold ground. We go to sleep the night and uh, everything is okay. And I wake up the next morning and I look across at where the pilots were sleeping and you see all these guys with their stretchers, with their feet up above, <laughs> above their dugouts. <laughs> Man, did we rag, <laughs> we rag them about that. So anyway, interesting stories with that. <clears throat> and um, we were situated at the Hague 
for the period. And uh, we were tasked um, to go and do a something which was uh, <laughs> very questionable. And uh, I made my, 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 my voice pretty, pretty stern about this. Um, the four day control for any advanced mechanized unit is normally done by a high flying aircraft. The boss pocket was utilized in those days as the Telstar was unfortunately uh, unserviceable, but the attack had to be launched. So the mechanized unit of Rantles um, was advancing towards the target at uh, Mongua, and um, they decided to toss two Alouettes to do Telstar. Now Telstar flies at a pretty high altitude uh, where they are safe enough to be able to elude any um, anti-aircraft fire. Alouette flies at 60 knots for harmonized gunfire, maximum of 80 to 90 knots because they're heavily loaded with those cannons and all the ammunition. And for us to fly around at a thousand foot, it's like uh, shooting at a duck. We were uh, <clears throat> orbiting ahead of the mechanized unit and uh, one of the guys in, in, in the mechanized unit asked if we were firing our cannons. So obviously we're not because we've got nothing to shoot at. <laughs> so we uh, asked them, look, do you guys, can you hear the firing? Which way is it coming from? Dead silence. Then they asked again, are the Alouettes firing their cannons? No, we're not. Okay. And uh, my pilot, old Scoops, Lieutenant, radios uh, Brut Ruiz and the other Alouette, and he says to him, Brut, you know, um, where are you guys? Because, uh, you know, we're, we're flying, we're flying orbits around us and we can't see you. No answer. So he says to me, Steve, can you have a look, see if you can see the other Alouette? And I, I leaned out the helicopter and I looked back. And there was this gunship angled at about 45 degrees. And it was just burning from, from the cockpit all the way back. Just one ball of flame. And they headed straight down, impl imploded into the ground, huge ball of flame. So I said to him, you better get down. You better get down, there's ACAC here. So we went right down to tree level and we flat footed back to, to the HAC, Heli Admin Group. And uh, we radioed back at there was, the aircraft just got shot down. What had happened was there was a mobile anti-aircraft gun in Mongua that was taking pot shots and they eventually got them. So they were taking pot shots at both of the aircraft. So it was one of those days, you're, it's not your time. Uh, Brut Ruiz and Clifton Stacy died in that, and uh, it was a pretty sad day for us. Um, then, um, the doing my special tours at this point in time, you know, you go back and you come in every single time. I um, in that same tour, interesting story actually. Um, Neil Ellis, or Nellis, <laughs> we were up doing a follow-up near Mupa in Angola. And uh, the, it was 3-2 actually, were 3-2 battalion. They'd found a couple of uh, Land Rovers in the field, brand spanking new Land Rovers, but there were no keys in them. So Swap would left the Land Rovers and they'd flat-footed it out of the town. And uh, um, Willem Rata actually asked, can anyone, you know, what, we can't start these things, can anyone? So I said, I can start them, no problem. So Nellis flew us out, flew me out to the, to the first uh, Land Rover, I jumped out. Now I got one of the three two battalion chaps with me, one of the black chaps. I showed him exactly what to do. I cut the ignition wires, 
put the two together. I said to him, look, you put these two together, you see, lights go on. That's big grin. I just see teeth. <laughs> okay, right, you've got the lights on. Now you take this one and then you just touch it to that one. And the starter will turn. Start the engine, off we go. And he goes raggy being around with his land rover. I flat footed back to the aircraft and we go to the next one. That was a, a petrol driven um, land rover, gas driven. And the next one, jump out, I run up to it, it's a diesel. Fortunately, I could get that thing going the same way. Taught the other guy how to do this, the other three two battalion, and this, the two of them chasing each other all over the bush to get back to Makua. Uh, needless to say, it was uh, quite a quite an interesting operation. <laughs> uh, then um, after that uh, operation, uh, we lost uh, another Puma um, with the chief of the Air Force's son on board as well, John Robertson. Robinson actually, and um, the flight engineer were all killed. Uh, Puma got, got shot down. And uh, the next thing was Nellis and I back again in Operation Super. And Operation Super was uh, in 1982. Um, in fact, <laughs> today is 40 year anniversary of Operation Super. <laughs> wow. Anyway, so um, we were deployed to the Marianne Flusch once more. And uh, um, Nellis, myself, uh, Angelo Maranta, and uh, Eugene von der Merwe, uh, we were the first two Alouettes out there uh, operating with the uh, reconnaissance unit, actually. And uh, that infiltrated and they'd found a base and they were doing follow-ups to establish now where exactly the space was because they'd got indication that there was a big base being built up there for infiltration into the western side of um, Southwest Africa at that point. Um, we um, proceeded to do follow-ups all the time and uh, eventually uh, we were called out um, and uh, the two aircraft, that's uh, uh, Eugene, myself, Nellis, and um, Angela Maranta, we were called up by the recce to come and actually give them assistance. When we rolled up, there were these troops walking down a road, single pass. <laughs> what had happened is the, the recce is dressed as tours, and the, and the, and the Swapu terrorists met each other, and they were arguing. They're calling each other Swapu. <laughs> so they had this argument and then eventually the, the, the white guy started to pull his rifle and they flat footed it out the way and disappeared. And when we came over the horizon, there were these Swapu group walking in single file. So after the attack, you know, we got a couple, couple of captures and uh, we, kept, we interrogated these guys and found out where the main base was. So we were gonna go in that afternoon uh, we brought in a whole bunch of Pumas and uh, more gunships. And uh, as we went in the afternoon, there was this huge rain cloud storm, uh, rainstorm all over the, the attack area. So we couldn't come in close to it. And uh, we then decided to postpone the, the attack till the next day. And uh, Operation Super started earlier the next morning. It was... Uh, it was a heavy fight, long fight, all day long. Um, Nellis was my pilot. Uh, Eugene was flying with Angela Maranta. We had Charlie Ben from 22 Squadron with Manny Janssen and uh, a whole lot of other good friends of mine as well. Uh, it was a huge operation. Um, we'd flown in fuel from, from Ondangwa with the C-130s. They'd done paradrops of fuel and brought in um, Dakotas, brought in troops. We had 90 uh, troops against uh, that whole attack. It was quite an operation. Nellis actually spoke very uh, clearly about how that operation took place. And uh, it was one thing and I have to mention here, because I said to Nellis, I'm going to get you for this. I'm going to get you for this. When uh, there was a point when Nellis spoke about uh, we actually had to land because we were low on fuel, etc. 
and uh, both of us were taking a leak when uh, when they fired a Sam uh, uh, RPG across at us, and the, he pistol over himself, and I just about pistol over myself, and we got back into the aircraft. We started flying again, but I'd been shooting so much that day that I was very low on low on ammo. So I said to him, you know, because he was controlling the fire, the firefight from 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 the air, and I mean. An amazing operator, Nemesis. Really is amazing operator. It was such a pleasure to work with him. At the one point in time, I'm trying to tell him, Nellis, I'm running out of ammo. <laughs> he wasn't paying any attention. So I get to him, I said to him, Nellis, I've got no more ammo. So what is Nellis here? We're, we've got no more ammo. Okay, that's all he hears. But I've still got about 20 rounds. Okay. And I'm, I spot to my left here because there was a ravine. And 3-2 Battalion couldn't get into the ravine. They just couldn't move past it because there's a bugger sitting there shooting down at them all the time. So I spotted him, and as I spotted him like that, I lifted up and I let him have it with 10 rounds. Here. Blah, blah, blah. Man, I thought Nellis was going to freaking... <laughs> I thought he was going to jump out the aircraft. He absolutely cracked himself. He turned around and looks at me and says, over here, over here. So I said to him, no, no. I think you just pissed yourself because... I told you, we're running low on ammo. I didn't say we got no ammo. <laughs> Interesting story. Anyway, it was absolutely a pleasure I'd always to operate with a professional like Nellis. Sim and I uh, became very good friends, um, and uh, we still communicate to this day. Um, in fact, uh, it was that, that same year, or say in 82, when uh, I was deployed once again, and Nellis came and Strange story, and Nillis sort of um, had the pick of who he wants to fly with. Uh, and I got off the aircraft at Tondongwa, and who's waiting for me there? Neil Ellis, in his uh, little pickup truck, his little Nissan. He comes and he says to me, get your flying kit, get your weapons, uh, we're, we're on our way. I said, but I've got to clear in. I've got to... He says, no, just get what you need. Okay, and give the stuff here to the clock, the ops clock. He'll clear in for you. He'll sort things out. We're off. And we deployed immediately um, to, uh, to, to Onjiva. At this point in time, the defense force had taken over Onjiva um, for the runway because we were going to prepare this to start operating the Impala fighters from the ground attack aircraft. Anyway, deployed to Onjiva, and um, the guys were having a problem with the captured 23 mil ACAC that they had there. So I, I tinkered around with the thing, tinkered around, and I found out what the problem was. I fixed it, copped it, and then uh, it's got a foot trigger. I let it go. <laughs> and I tell you <laughs> that that causes stir. And from that day onwards, everyone wanted to play on the 23 ball. <laughs> it's quite a, it's quite an amazing weapon to play with. <laughs> it's got these two uh, beer can type cylinders at the top. You see the flames come out of that thing. It's quite impressive. Okay. Um, after that, uh, back to the squadron, doing squadron duties, etc. But we were doing so many bush tours. Um, That's months up, months down, months up, months down. And... Um, I'd, uh, at this point in time, was um, transferred from uh, Bloem Bloemfontein back to 22 Squadron, who were now doing operational tours. And I get the best of two worlds. I'm at the squadron I want to be at, plus I can still go and make trouble. <laughs> and uh, right uh, we we left um, left Bloemfontein in the middle of 1983. My then wife uh, and I packed our stuff, all our belongings, and we took the long road down to to Cape Town. Strange story. <laughs> I'd bought myself a a little MGA Roadster that I was going to rebuild. And uh, this card, um, oil rings were gone. 
so it would smoke heavily. So if the moment you push the revs too high, you just see this blue plume of smoke coming out the back. So instruct her very clearly, look, keep the car below 50 miles an hour, we'll be okay. Just don't go over 50 miles an hour. Yeah? Just keep it at that, we'll be okay. And now I had a big XS 1100 Yamaha. So I'm riding the Yamaha and she's riding in the, in the sports car. We'd left my, my um, Alpha at that point in time was my parents and we were taking these two down to Cape Town. My parents were going to come visit me and they would bring the Alpha back. So we're driving along, driving along and the next minute I said to her, listen, instead of, you know, because the Yamaha, I've got to refuel every two, 300 kilometers. Um, instead of you stopping, continue riding and then I'll catch up with you quickly. I mean, I can do 200 Ks like that. You know? And uh, I can stop, I refuel, defuel at the same time, you know, at the toilet, <laughs> back on the Yamaha and um, I'll push her up to about 160. And I thought, oh, I'll catch her up pretty quickly. Eventually I'm doing just on 200 kilometers an hour to try and find her. And then the distance, I see this plume of blue smoke. So I eventually catch up with her, pull her over, and the two of us have this uh, tete a tete. <laughs> in, in Afrikaans, they call it babluxum. <laughs> Both of us are a little bit, a little bit high tempered. Anyway, discussions ended, and then we stuck to each other from there on all the way down to Cape Town. Um, very interesting move to Cape Town. Then, um, we uh, settled in in the Cape and I did my first uh, tour to the Eastern Caprivi at uh, Air Force Base Rundu. Very relaxing compared to Ondangwa. Ondangwa was operations all the time. There were follow-ups. I mean, it was either internal follow-ups or it was uh, external into Angola. So there was a lot of work always. Where Rundu was much more of a relaxed environment, go cruising down the river with Alouette, looking at all the animals and stuff visiting the Navy bases, because they had a couple of Navy bases there with uh, Naval personnel, the Marines. And uh, it was interesting. I, I enjoyed the, the, the Rindu trips. Then um, I got back to the squadron and I had my first sea trip on a frigate with the SAS President Kruger. And uh, <laughs> there's this uh, fellow flight engineer called Nick the Bat. I'll tell you the story in a little while about Nick the Bat. Anyway, we are deployed on the SAD President Kruger with a Westland Wasp to go and do some um, operations with them. They were uh, sailing um, just south of Cape Town, uh, probably about 100 miles, and uh, doing a bit of operations there. It's quite interesting being on a frigate. It's a very narrow boat. It rolls like crazy <laughs> and uh, it does some weird things to your guts, I tell you. But uh, needless to say, the more you drink, the less you worry about it. <laughs> so um, we go down to, we, we style the wasp the evening, the Western wasp, and uh, we get assigned to our cabins. Um, don't know if you've ever been on a frigate before, Chris, but... Uh, <laughs> It's very cramped, I tell you. Anyway, we get assigned to our cabins and we're busy uh, getting ourselves set up for the evening. And uh, then we deployed to the uh, Rechmarker place, you know, uh, Mess 10. Mess 10 is where you can sit down and enjoy yourself, the NCO's pub. So we're in the pub there. And uh, the reason why Nick the Bat gets his name is we're busy drinking away, and the next minute, you've got all these uh, pipes in, in throughout the ship, you know, you've got all your, your supply pipes, your, um, uh, all, all, all the, the, the um, um, uh, uh, fluid supply mechanisms are through the piping in the, on, on the ship itself. I'm looking left, and the next minute I look right, here's Nick hanging by his legs up in the blimping. <laughs> up on the pipes. <laughs> He's got his drink in his hand and now he downs his drink upside down. So that's how Nick the Bat gets his name. <laughs> Interesting story. 
Um, at this point in time, um, I get uh, I get a phone call at the squadron. Um, Hello, Sergeant Kutia. Very sexy voice. I said, oh, 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 hello, hello. <laughs> and uh, the, the young lady says, Lieutenant so and so from uh, Air Force Headquarters, um, and starts asking me questions about uh, did you get a fine for uh, pranging a, a, bed, a Bedford? I said, oops. <laughs> uh, um, yes. Okay, now I see that. And then, oh, I see that you're. Uh, you, you haven't been awarded the Proparcha medal yet? So, no. So, I see you've done quite a number of uh, operational tours. Yes, yes. Okay, well, um, all right, thanks very much. Uh, um, we'll, uh, we're just doing a follow-up check, et cetera, we're doing a security check and so on. Yes, sure. Now I'm in trouble. So I hang up the phone and I'm thinking to myself, what the hell was that about? And asking all sorts of personal questions about my career. And the next minute, an announcement at 22 Squadron, uh, the acting officer commanding Charlie Bent uh, must uh, report to his office immediately. So I thought, oh my word. Steve, you're in the shit, my friend. <laughs> so I smartly march into the office, salute. Charlie says to me, Steve, sit down, sit down, sit down. Oh, okay, I can't be that deep in the trouble now. So he says to me, let me be the first one to congratulate you. So I said, uh, beg your pardon? He says, now you've been uh, awarded the Honoris Crooks. I said, I beg your pardon? He says, no, uh, you've been awarded the Honoris Crooks. Then he wanted to ask me out about it. I, I was dumbstruck. You know, uh, we are doing our job. We're not doing anything more but doing our job. And I was dumbstruck. I just, I just, it didn't ping with me. Um, went home that night and I didn't even tell the wife. I just said, strange, you know, and it, trying to absorb what was, <laughs> what this is all about. And needless to say, um, we um, ended up uh, in Port Elizabeth. Uh, with a huge military parade, you know, once, once, uh, once every couple of years, they'd have these huge parades, etc. And it was mechanized units and battalions and freaking um, squadrons and of people marching and all that sort of stuff. And uh, there was uh, a number of us and a bunch of three two chaps that were awarded the the Norris Crooks, and uh, Nellis and myself and two of the black troops of 3-2 Battalion were awarded the Honoris Crooks for uh, our operations in, in Operation Super. Um, it, uh, it was a very sobering um, effort, but uh, it, was, it was great to see uh, people being honored. Um, at the same time, I got back from Port Elizabeth and uh, got this bee in my bonnet that I needed to be more qualified. And I started studying. I needed to get my degree or at least an engineering diploma. I'd gone halfway through the studies, I might as well complete them. And um, I started doing uh, my follow through. We need, I needed 12 subjects total uh, with uh, follow through of math, science, uh, strength of materials and engineering design. So got that put away and did uh, nice, oh, in, interesting school block. Um, I then uh, was uh, due for my next special tour as Operation Ascari. And uh, I had my first introduction into post-traumatic stress syndrome. Uh, we were doing a heck of a lot of follow-up operations, a lot of deep uh, deployments. Um, couple of photographs um, that you'll see are of deployments where we're camped right outside uh, deep in Angola, actually Nellis and myself again. <laughs> and uh, we were at base uh, refreshing, uh, getting refreshed so we can deploy for the next day again. And uh, I'm not gonna mention the name, but uh, one of the fellow flight engineers was sitting there early morning and uh, 
he was sobbing like a baby. And I thought, well, God's drunk. <laughs> Just leave him be. And uh, he, he was broken. He was, he was really broken. And um, I went over to the Ongdangwa hospital and asked for one of the doctors to please come and speak to this guy and uh, deployed back home that same day. So that was my first introduction into PTSD. Um, still didn't understand what it was and why it was and how it, how it affected, but the guy was broken. Um, my, my then wife was pregnant at this time and I was gonna become a dad. <laughs> So um, can you believe it? I'm 10th of May. My daughter's born on the 12th of May in 1984. And a redhead like I was, I um, don't know what happened, but anyway, maybe I dyed it. <laughs> Man, and a temper to match, I promise. <laughs> but anyway, the apple of dad's eye, absolute apple of my eye. The the effects that Nicole had on, on me were, were amazing. You know, you, you have something that you always want to be the best for. And she was the apple of my for that perspective. At this point in time, I'd start taking up marathon running. Um, the number of people that had been shut down and had to flat foot it getting out, running out of there, just made me more, um, more aware, pertinently aware of the fact that I needed to be ready in case I had to run. Um, I'd already been hit twice and I've always been fortunate that we've been able to fly out of there. Even though the aircraft were broken, we were able to fly them away. Other guys had not been that lucky. Um, when I rejoined the Air Force the second time, in that first week during orientation, Quisleer and uh, his pilot were shot down and the pilot managed to get out, but Quis was shot through the neck. Um, and these reminders, because there was uh, the Puma Shudan um, um, and uh, Capra, Capra, the Brute Ruiz and Clifton Stacy in the Alouette. So I made sure that I was fit and I was partaking in, in marathons. Interesting scenario. <laughs> anyway, I managed to do it and I, I ran quite a couple of those. I don't think with this big weight of mine today, I'll be able to do it, but I can always dream, can't I? Anyway, on the uh, 12th of May, Nicole was born and started a new life for me. And uh, in, 19, uh, in 1985, uh, we got a call out the um, Major Alan Reynolds and myself got a call out um, uh, over a weekend to do uh, a mountain climber rescue off Table Mountain. And the lad was in such a crazy situation that we actually couldn't hoist him. He had too much injuries. We couldn't get a basket up there. So what we did is we got, we got the guys to carry him into the Alouette while we balanced the main, uh, one of the main wheels on a rock. And we carried him in that way and managed to rescue the guy. It was uh, one of the most rewarding things in, in the Air Force is being able to do rescues and uh, help people in need. Uh, when I was in Bloemfontein, we did a lot of the uh, floods reliefs. It did the same from, from 22 Squadron as well. A lot of the uh, Burland areas during floods and things like that, we would deploy to them and go and, go and do flood relief disaster training for them. Then um, in, um, I'm getting myself lost here. <laughs> in uh, 1983, in an operation of scurry I spoke about. And then we also started developing uh, the night vision goggles. Uh, I was in a tour at Tondongwa and Neil Ellis came to me, he said to me, can you fix these? There were two monocle 
uh, set of NVG goggles that they used on the Bofa cannons uh, surrounding the base at Ondangwa. Um, I took them apart and I saw that there was a couple of wires broken, fixed them, put in new batteries, got them operating. And uh, then him and I sat down and discussed how we would operate. Yeah. He would uh, um, make sure that he maintains the right altitude and the speed, et cetera. And I would patter him in. Pattering is when you are talking to the pilot about positioning him around, et cetera. Uh, we went out for a circuit around the base at night that first time, just the, just the two of us. And uh, I copped a weapon. And at the end of the runway is where we used to test the weapon. We had an old vehicle lying over there. And I pulled off the trigger and I just blinded myself because it was the first generation NVGs. They didn't flash close. So I thought, okay, let's try this again. So you take aim, take aim, close your eyes and then pull the trigger, bam, hit the target. So we worked out a way of operating NVGs. And that was the beginning um, of lunar operations. I wrote a long um, report, uh, which uh, Nellis put a cover on and uh, submitted that. And that was the introduction of lunar operations. Uh, we upped the night vision goggles to the third generation, which would close down and flash and got soft lighting in the cockpit. And that's how it initiated. The Pumas eventually would also have night vision goggle systems in as well. Um, then a point became where we had uh, less, less active tours, and I got a strange, strange phone call with respect to uh, what is my future going to be, what I want to do, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I just let it be. I was not really interested in ex expanding on it, and I'll allude a little bit further to it later on. Um, Another one of the purposes of, a, of, a, of a, a, a coastal squadron, in actual fact, is to uh, complete support of the South African Navy. So all the vessels that could carry helicopters, a 22 squadron would support those, those vessels. One of those vessels was the SAS Pratia, which was a survey vessel, a research and survey vessel. We deployed to um, the SAS Pratia uh, with uh, two pilots and uh, two engineers. Uh, we took uh, one of the instructor engineers with as well, Salis von Rendsburg, and uh, Mark Reed and myself were the flight engineers uh, in an alouette um, with the Dayglow panels on for as a naval operated helicopter. Landed on the Pratia and uh, we went to, as far as we were concerned, we we're just going to deploy up and down the West Coast. It's a survey vessel. That's what it does. We ended up at a, a place called Seamount Vima. Now, Seamount Vima is an under, underwater volcano. And the strange thing is when you arrive there, the water is warmer than the surrounding West Coast water. And you know the West Coast water is pretty cold, very dangerously cold, actually. And the sea life around there is, is phenomenal. And uh, first thing we do is pull out hand lines, fishing lines, and you do hand fishing. And we were pulling out yellowtail and freaking all sorts of glorious fish. And needless to say, we ate like kings that night. Because all the fish that was caught was prepared by one of the cooks on board. And this guy was the best at preparing meals. The... We then proceeded up the coast and uh, got to just outside Luanda, actually, far off, off, of the, off the coast. And uh, then uh, got back to Cape Town a couple of weeks later to find out that we were actually on standby for Vainan de Toy. Uh, the wreck is had been captured, a lot of them shot and killed, and Vainant was captured. So it was pretty sobering for us, but at the same time, you know, you felt helpless. 
so helpless. Because what can you do with a single alouette with day glow panels on it? What what can you do? So very frustrating for us, but anyway, an interesting story. Very sad about um, the birds that lost their lives and uh, the capture of Vaynant. But his, his story is, is quite phenomenal to listen to. Then um, I get a I get a strange phone call. And uh, the, the question is from Neil Ellis. Says to me, uh, Steve, how would you like to be in the police force for a while? I said, I beg your pardon? He says, no. Um, you know the BO 105 helicopters? So I said, yes. I've actually worked on them when I was a civilian for a bit. He says, well, the police force is buying them and they're looking for some flight engineers to get these things up and running. I said, perfect. <laughs> and uh, it's, uh, um, we were two flight engineers seconded to the police force to start the, the police the air, police air wing up. And uh, Hans Arnold, myself, were the two flight engineers and uh, a bunch of pilots were transferred across as well. The BR-105 is not really a flight engineer aircraft because it's a single pilot operated and pretty modern aircraft. But the pilots also, all Air Force guys, insisted that we fly with. Um, they preferred us to be with in case something needs to be done, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we, <laughs> we, we spent a year with the, the police force and we had a couple of interesting trips. Um, the Soweto rights, for example. Um, one of the BR-105s took a, a stone to the blade, damaged the blade, and uh, some other interesting deployments that we had up and down. Needless to say, I did not really enjoy the deployment to the SAP very much, but did the best of what we could to make sure that those guys get supported and get up and running. Um, I phoned up uh, Nellis and told him that we're not going to be able to continue. Um, can I get back to a helicopter squadron? And unfortunately, there was no postings back in Cape Town. And they posted me to a fixed wing squadron. And this was uh, in 1986 now. I ended up at uh, 25 squadron as a flying mechanic. <laughs> um, Interesting stories, though, because uh, we, we ended up doing some amazing trips, really amazing trips. And uh, we uh, deployed from Cape Town to Roy Corp, um, also to the border. And uh, we would do a two-week tour flying up and down the border, uh, doing supply trips, uh, trooping, and all that sort of stuff. Uh, eventually, I got a phone call to say, hey, wait a second. Um, I, I walked over to, to 30 Squadron, which was now the Puma Squadron, Puma and Super Fuel Squadron. I walked over to the squadron and I spoke to, to Don Bacon, war warrant officer was uh, in charge of the training there. And he told me that, uh, you know, they're very selective about the flight engineers that they choose there because they've got the two um, uh, Department of Environmental Affairs J model helicopters. And uh, they need uh, really qualified people to be able to do this. And uh, I said to him, okay, well, you know, you, it's worth the try. And uh, as I was walking out, um, a flight sergeant, Russell du Dupria, uh, Russell um, was an absolute star, absolute star. Anyway, chatting to Russell, and he says, man, you're more than qualified, Steve. I'll, I'll go speak to people. And uh, very soon, actually, I got transferred to to uh, to the squadron, and uh, I was now on my on the pound seats to become um, a flight engineer with thirty squadron. I just had one more trip to do with twenty five squadron, and uh, I got deployed 
with a, a chap by the name of Jan Brannewein van Seil. Now, Jan Brannewein is a, is a good, good Boersian, a real farmer boy, good, good lad, salt of the earth type person. And we had with us an Englishman called Mark Moses. Now, uh, I don't like speaking ill of the dead, but Mark, Mark was uh, a strange fellow. He's uh, no longer with us, but strange fellow. <laughs> had his own way of things. And he rubbed Jan up the wrong way. Anyway, we uh, deployed to, <laughs> to Grootfontein and uh, had the most interesting tour with Mark Moses. So much so that he was always in trouble and always ended up getting the hind end of everything. <laughs> I felt so sorry for him, but it was good fun. Uh, we did one of our racked ruts, ration trips, uh, where we went to all the, the bases up there with the, the DC-3 and took rations up to the various places. We ended up at Tondangwa the one night. It was strange coming back to Ondangwa, uh, where I had operated as a, as a gunship flight engineer, coming in there with a Dakota. Anyway, that night we were around the air crew bungalow, um, doing a barbecue and having fun, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I decided to play bagpipes. I don't know if you've ever played bagpipes. Never? Grab yourself a cat, shove it under your arm, squeeze, bite the tail, and it sounds like a bagpipe. <laughs> so it's a warm evening, and I'm standing without a shirt on, grab the cat, do the bagpipe thing. And the next minute, our young Branavan turns me around. He says to me, good grief, look at the blood. <laughs> the cat had scratched me all along the back. cat was just blood running out. Yeah, a lot of fun was had after that. <laughs> um, got back to, to Cape Town, and I was transferred over to 30 Squadron to start my tour as a flight engineer on Pumas. What an aircraft. I tell you, it is an absolute pleasurable aircraft to fly in. And uh, did my Puma conversion um, up at uh, a 19 Squadron in Pretoria. And uh, it was also in the same year, once we qualified as Puma engineers, that we had uh, a, chopper, a chopper reunion. Every number of years, they'd have a chopper reunion, and uh, this was done at SWAT Corp as well. Um, interesting story. <laughs> Nick Henning, who was on the course with me, um, him and I decided that we we're going to go and have some garlic. And uh, we ate garlic, but I mean, we had a, a hamburger with a layer of garlic, a patty, a layer of garlic, a tomato, layer of garlic, some onion, layer of garlic. And that's how we ate it. We got to the uh, function that evening and everyone was walking big rings around us. And uh, <laughs> we celebrated till early mornings, early morning, I tell you. Ended up back in my room and there wasn't place in my bungalow to sleep. It was bodies all over the place. Eventually a fellow flight engineer, a friend of mine, uh, George Avis, who was on fixed wings at the time, was lying in my bed. So I said to him, hey, hey, that's my bed. He says, all right, come lie here with me. <laughs> so the two of us in the bed there, and freaking, I tell you, it was horrendous. Anyway, uh, we continued partying. We had a breakfast the next morning, champagne breakfast at Sword Corps. And uh, there was all the chopper crews from the whole Air Force there. And... Uh, we celebrated with more champagne, blah, blah. And uh, I hit the road at probably around about 11 o'clock the morning, decided, no, nah, I'm going to go visit my parents in, in uh, Wittbank. So took a very gingerly drive to Wittbank. <laughs> Got there. I said to my mom and dad, I'm just going to go lie down a bit. And uh, I was in bed and I just passed out. Bam, gone. A couple of hours later, my dad came and he opened the door and he stuck his head in. He said, good God, you stink. <laughs> anyway, 
This is one of those stories that ended up as uh, one of the drunken drunken discussions. Um, my helicopter experience then was well underway, and I really enjoyed the aircraft immensely. A lot of a lot of my good friends, uh, Kenny van Straten, for example, very good friend of mine, still today. Him and I um, struck up a very good friendship from those days when I did my first Puma conversion. And I must admit, to me, it seemed like uh, my Air Force career had got a second breath. After my uh, uh, Puma conversion and uh, the uh, eventful <laughs> celebrations of the Tropi reunion, um, I was back down at uh, 30 Squadron and immediately started um, working on uh, the uh, Puma J conversion. Now, the Puma J was the Department of Environmental Affairs aircraft, and we operated and maintained them at the squadron. And they were painted the orange, white, and blue in the old South African flag, and uh, had amazing extra systems, additional hydraulic systems, um, additional navigation systems, TANS computers, etc. Very, very nice aircraft. And I made it a point to know the aircraft operating better than the pilots and how to maintain them better than myself. <laughs> I, I made a point of really knowing that aircraft very well. And um, I really did enjoy the, the time at 30 Squadron. Um, I continued then uh, finishing off my engineering studies with a, another school block. And uh, started doing Puma sea trips. Now, to deploy onto a ship with a Puma is quite an interesting story. It's, it's really a powerful machine. You could do so much with it. Um, then, um, a sad state of affairs, we lost uh, another flight engineer killed on the border. And um, it was uh, a rude awakening that we still involved 87 and we're still involved in this long war losing people left, right, and center. Um, I then built up as much knowledge as I could about the Puma to understand that I could really operate without ending in a situation where I didn't know what to do. Uh, we did another, I did another tour back at Ordangwa, um, doing deep penetrations into Angola. Um, we deployed from uh, the Marian Flus, <laughs> where we were previously. And uh, the penetration was pretty deep. Um, and uh, we were deploying with the uh, reconnaissance unit, Rekis, to drop them off and then uh, be on standby to support them if they needed us. Now, when we did these deep penetrations, we would have maximum fuel on board, which includes uh, the in internal ferry tanks. And uh, you can imagine how far a Puma can fly with four ferry tanks plus internal full, uh, full fuel. So the deployments were very deep. Um, the one deployment we went, we ended up uh, going along and uh, did the drop. Uh, you. You're um, in, in the Puma, you operate three crew, one on, uh, one on navigation, also on goggles. The pilot flying is on goggles only. The flight engineer is the verbal attitude, uh, airspeed indicator, a co co uh, communicator on what's going on. And I'm busy pattering away and I'm busy drinking water, pattering away, drinking water, because you, you, you're talking so much that you are constantly thirsty. And I'm busy pattering, busy pattering. And as I'm saying to us, we would agree on the, the lowest altitude before we start panicking. So I'd say to him, all right, you're at 50 foot AGL, 120 knots, attitude, uh, attitude is okay, blah, 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 you know, update the, you do all the navigation updates and the waypoints and so on, check your fuel transfers, uh, make sure the engineering side of things are correct, you know, and I'm busy pattering, busy pattering, and I'm saying to God, what's your altitude? You have got uh, uh, 50 foot, 40 foot, 30 foot, check, check your height, check your height. And they were coming over the top of a mountain like that. They could see it. 
we're not caught. <laughs> and the next minute, we're, we're, we're cruising along at a low altitude, and uh, the, the co-pilot who's doing the navigation looks to the pilot and he says to him, hey, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if we, what our next waypoint is. You know, he says, Steve, can you go down on NVG so I can quickly have a look in the map and just check things out? So I put my NVGs on while he's in the cockpit now. And I look up and I see we're over the sea. We're lost because we're, we're not supposed to be here. Yeah? We're supposed to be here. <laughs> and then only after a little, oh, oh, you, once you get used to what you're looking at, you see it's actually waves of this elephant grass blowing in the wind and it looks like sea. So it was quite an amazing operation there. Anyway, we did a number of those and uh, very interesting. Then um, back in Cape Town, um, I was still operating as a diver and uh, flight engineer. So you do a diver in, uh, uh, standby, then you do a flight, engine, uh, flight engineer standby, and then you're off for a period. You know, and This is how we used to split it up. Um, the, 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 the tour at, at study squadron was really interesting. It was giving me the opportunity to expand my knowledge and also operate with some of the best in the air force at that point in time. It was really giving us great exposure to what we as a embargoed country could achieve with all the um, modifications and the improvements that we were making to aircraft and uh, weaponry at that point. Um, I was back on a, a special tour again doing uh, um, night casavacs. Now, I don't know, a casualty evacuation with a puma was always done very deep and very late at night or early mornings, etc. cetera. And uh, the, 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 the chances that you're gonna end up pulling fire or being involved in some type of crossfire is so great. And uh, I remember the evening with uh, the late Mike Bagee and myself and the co-pilot, we came into land um, and there was injured, a lot of injured people, a lot of injured troops with uh, 3 2 Battalion involved in fact. And the guys would, being pulled in, being pulled in, being pulled in. We were told there was a Kazavak of, of five people, which is no problem, as Puma can pick up five people, no issue. And eventually, um, I said to Mike, we can't take any more people. There's no more space. They were just piling them in. So eventually, we closed the doors and said to him, take power, let's get out of here. And he got, and the aircraft was so heavy that we could barely, barely just make the, the trees as we pulled out of there. And the, the Puma, when it's overloaded and you're taking power of the collective pitch, the rotor revs, main blades revs, they start dropping. And if they drop below a certain RPM, you lose your alternators, you lose your autopilot, you lose everything and you go straight down. So he held it, I'll tell you, he nursed that Puma into the air and eventually uh, we got forward flight and we started moving back and uh, I dropped all the curtains in the in the cabin, dropped the main curtain between the cockpit and the cabin at the back and put the lights on. And we had 16 people in the aircraft. 16 with all their kit and weaponry, etc. All injured guys. So that was quite amazing. A Puma is a wonderful aircraft. Anyway, we brought those guys back and uh, managed to do um, the run safely. Um, back in, uh, back in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in South Africa, um, I had the, the pleasure and opportunity to utilize the J model Pumas, the, the ones that we deployed to Antarctica with, to actually go and build a uh, radio tower on top of uh, Simonstown as um, uh, the the mountain overlooking. Um, uh, um, trying to think of the place now. <laughs> uh, 
overlooking Simon's Town and uh, this side, there's this huge tower that was put up there for silver mine. Silver mine, that's the area I'm talking about. And uh, we used the Joe models actually to fly up uh, buckets full of concrete to lay the foundation. And then the guys would open up and run the concrete out. We'd fly down, pick up another load of concrete and bring it up, etc. So it was quite interesting to use them for that. Um, and we uh, completed that task in, in half a day, actually. Just bring it up, built a foundation, got it going. Then that was my next deployment. Now, the late Soti Sardin was probably the most, most uh, a colorful flight engineer the Air Force has ever known. Soti was, a, was a, a qualified as a, a armorer in the Air Force. And late in his life, he decided to become a flight engineer. So he did a trade change, qualified as an aircraft maintenance engineer, and then did a flight engineer's course. Now, as a flying armorer, he was really entertaining, and he came up with the weirdest of ideas. I mean, he built a chute to an actual fact, chuck out uh, smoke grenades um, out of the cargo hole of the Puma. And then uh, he decided that's not good enough, so he used to uh, hot wire a hand grenade and then throw that at, at trenches and stuff. So he came up with some unique ideas of Soti Sardin. What a wonderful chap. Anyway, Sochi and I were back in the hangar with our pumas and uh, we'd pull them in the hangar at, at Dondangwa and uh, do the maintenance on them, get them ready for the next day's flying. And uh, the parabats were stationed right next door to us with, uh, with a mortar pipe um, and uh, everything to support that. And they would see us working in the hangar. Now, if you let off a mortar right next to a hangar, it's pretty loud. And uh, that mortar went off. I tell you, I came down from that puma so quickly, I thought we were being attacked. So T wet himself as well. We came out there and we called the guys the F of this and F of that and F you and that, blah, 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 big words, big words. We called them that. And they just laughed at us. The So T says to me, don't worry, don't worry. Tomorrow night is going to be interesting. Now, we were off. Uh, for the next day, two days. Um, there was a mechanical issue with the Puma's uh, rear, tur rear turbine bearings. It's another story for another day. This is more interesting. <laughs> so, um, the whole day, we're eating uh, anything that can loosen your stomach up. Anything. All right? And by, by early evening, we've got a collection. All right. And this collection is in a nice container. And as it gets to late evening, we sneak up to the mortar pipe and we um, lubricate it <laughs> with our donations. So Sochi and I are back in the hangar, put the radio on so the people think we're working, making a lot of noise. In the meantime, we're sitting outside on the chairs watching this lot. And the first mortar goes in and deploys. And the next minute, dead silence. Guy grabs another mortar, deploys. And you see a flashlight go on. Guy turns and he says, no, this is just shit. <laughs> the whole mortar hole was just covered in crap. <laughs> Needless to say, I think we got them back. <laughs> anyway, um, back at the squadron again, and it's now coming towards the end of... Uh, 1987, and uh, the Puma is used as a VIP aircraft. And um, um, the president then, uh, Mr. President P.W. Buta and his entourage um, were using uh, the Puma to go and do a little tour up to uh, the West Coast, to the Cedarburg. Um, he had some good relations with uh, the Nivots at their farm. So we deployed up the west coast to go look at the flowers first. And uh, the president and his entourage walked around and uh, back in the aircraft, off to the Nivots farm. We landed over there. We treated to an awesome lunch. Um, strange thing is that one of my 
fellow flight engineers, uh, his wife was part of the Nivot family. <laughs> so Chris Strange, we I'd been there with my my my, my ex wife before with Pitt and his wife, and we'd visited. So it was quite strange seeing them in the different scenario with the state president and his entourage. Anyway, got back into the Puma. Now we're going to deploy back to Cape Town and I select start and the jet pipe temperature just ran away, completely ran away. So I had to shut her down, jump up, see if I can fix it. And I just couldn't get this thing to stop running away. Temperature kept running away. Eventually, now we're going to try and find alternate ways to get the state president back to Cape Town because the aircraft won't start. At the end of the day, I decided, wait, I'm going to do a manual thing. So I broke the fuel control units thing and rotated it back and worked it a couple of times just to, because it's obviously getting stuck somewhere. Put it back on and just at the final point where they're making a decision to bring in another aircraft or to drive the state president back again, I get her going. <laughs> so it was uh, by hook or by crook, we managed to get that thing sorted and got the president back in his place. Then um, I ended up doing a supervisor's course. You're now a flight sergeant. You've got to start learning to be a supervisor at the Air Force College in uh, Pretoria. And uh, yeah, uh, lots of other drunken stories that we can discuss, but we won't because uh, I might embarrass myself even further. So anyway, back at the, the squadron, um, a very sad day um, in... Uh, the end of, uh, end of 1987, with the loss of the uh, SAA Helderberg off Mauritius. And um, we were deployed with the um, South African ship, the uh, SAS Tafelberg, um, and two Pumas to go and assist in the uh, search area to locate the aircraft and uh, support it for that period. Um, that was... Uh, Quite interesting trip. Uh, we sailed with the Tafelberg to Mauritius and then um, did the deployment support from Mauritius, um, uh, from the vessel actually to, to the, to the uh, search area. And uh, at a point in time, uh, Russell Dupree was the flight engineer on the one aircraft and I was the flight engineer on the other. Uh, we actually deployed uh, to the search area, which is uh, around about uh, two hours flying. And uh, we would have ferry tanks of fuel. And the ship had actually gone uh, back to Mauritius and uh, it was out of range. So they asked us to find an island to land on. And then they, and when they're in range, we'll be able to take off and then join the ship again. And uh, we, we found this uh, desolate little island and uh, landed the two pumas, and we were walking around, having fun for a couple of hours, etc. And uh, then we check in with the ship every hour or so, and the ship said, "Yeah, they're ready to receive us." So jump into the aircraft, and as true as pop, both aircraft, the right-hand engine wouldn't start. Both aircraft, left-hand engine starts, and right-hand engine wouldn't start. So. I uh, quickly jump up, make some changes, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we had what we called jabo clips. There's two trocadile clips with a piece of wire. And then there was the mobile unit, um, a T5 relay at a, 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 just above the flight engineer's head here, where you take the cover off and you can actually bypass some of the, the, uh, um, the circuit breakers and stuff. You bypass the, the relays. It was a relay D that we used to bypass. And then you short circuit the starting cycle. So it gets it going. And uh, managed to get bound gang. So shut it down, said to the pilots, do a walk around the aircraft, make sure that everything is stowed and corrected. I'm gonna go and help Russell quickly. He's battling with his aircraft. We tried the same on his aircraft, it just didn't work. So Russell comes to me, says to me, you know what, let's bridge out the, the plug on the aircraft itself. Okay. So I get up there and I take the plug off, put a piece of locking wire to bridge it out, start it up, pull the wire out, 
put the plug back, close the cowlings, et cetera, et cetera, get his aircraft running. I go running over to my aircraft, get in, say to the pilots, are we good? Yeah, we're good. Okay, open the, both fuel throws, off we go. Take off, we fly. Get to board, make it up to the ship, land on the Tafelberg, and I reach back to go and take the access ladder that to a quad so I can climb up and open the cowlings. My access ladder is not there. So I walk up to my pilot, I said to him, did you guys close the cowlings? Yes. Did you take the ladder off? Oops. <laughs> so the ladder had flown off and it was lying somewhere in the ocean and probably still is <laughs> in the ocean, in the Indian Ocean. Anyway, we safely made it back and uh, it was an interesting couple of months that we spent in Mauritius. Um, not a lot of stories to talk about, but um, more prevalent to the operation itself. Then in, um, uh, in January of uh, 1988, there were uh, some very bad floods in Uppington. There was so much rain on the, in, in the inland and it obviously floods down to Uppington and the Orange River was flooded to its brim. Uh, we deployed and uh, arrived in Uppington and uh, started firstly um, making sure that all the rescues that we could get, people that were stuck and couldn't move, etc. We got them out and then we started supplying food to those that were isolated. And uh, on the one day, I... Um, I was not feeling good and I thought, geez, yeah, the, the chief technical officer, myself, had a couple of drinks the night before, but I wasn't beyond normal operating mode. I was, I was in slow mode, <laughs> yeah, sure I was, but I was still able to walk and I, it's not, I'm not, yeah, I'm not bubbleless. It's not, there's no hangover here. This is something strange. Anyway, we pull in for the first refuel land the aircraft and uh, roll the drums closer and I'm like, really, really feeling bad. Not feeling good at all, man. And I decided, oh, I rip my overall open, you know, my flight suit, open it up, pull it down and tight around my waist and I look down and I'm covered in little red dots all over my body. <laughs> all over. I'm freaking covered. I look like, like, like something out of the freaking movies there. Eh? A chicken box. Now, what had happened, my daughter, my little daughter, the week before, I stayed home for a day or two, and she had chicken pox. And I, as far as I was concerned, I had it, I had it as a kid. Now, I'm sure I had it as a kid. No, I didn't. <laughs> so I got chicken pox. I was as sick as a dog. Um, another Puma came in to replace me. Um, the whole crew came in, actually, because they wanted to take the aircraft back. And I actually flew back in a stretcher. I was so sick. <laughs> Deployed me back again, back to the to chase the plot. So it was uh, interesting that. I ended up on another tour to Ondongo on, a, on the, in the Puma. And uh, I was really privileged <laughs> to do another VIP sortie to uh, Jonas Avimbi's uh, uh, base camp. Uh, with uh, President P.W. Boerta, Puk Boerta, Baron Duplessis, and David de Villiers. And a uh, very interesting story. <laughs> very interesting story. Um, we arrived at Jamba, which was the headquarters for Jadis of Mbis group, UNITA. And uh, the, this evening, uh, we were standing there um, they had this uh, sheet of, of, of fire, you know, that made a fire pit. And uh, we were on the opposite side of the fire pit and the VIP tables with Jonas of MB's generals, uh, President P.W. Boerta, Puk Boerta, and the other ministers all at the main table. And they were obviously having deep discussion, et cetera, et cetera. Now, we're standing this side. There's free booze. Anything that you can think of from all around the world, there's free booze. Why leave Air Force guys in front of a table like that? So we were helping ourselves, obviously. And uh, one thing led to another the next minute. But Boerta gets up 
and he walks through the fire. And I mean through the fire, this fire pit on the ground. He walks through the fire and he comes over to us and he's, he says, okay, where's the, where's the booze? Where's the brandy and Coke? Because that was his stable, stable drink, brandy and Coke. So I said to him, geez, geez, minister, aren't you, aren't you, aren't you scared of walking through the fire? He says, ek vat nie kak van vonke nie. I don't take shit from flames. <laughs> so, Needless to say, we had an interesting evening with uh, with uh, Pukwuta. And um, um, on, the, um, <laughs> on, on the way back to the aircraft the next morning, um, Puk comes to me, he says to me, Steve, Steve, can you do your, your normal briefing? So I said to him, I beg your pardon? He says, man, you know that briefing you did way back? That guy had the most amazing memory. He said, you gave us that, that, that Air Force briefing of yours. I said, uh, okay. I said, <laughs> you're wanting me to lay my career on the line so that you can laugh. He says, no, 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 don't worry. Don't, it'll be okay. It'll be okay. Yeah. So anyway, state prison gets in, freaking... All the ministers get in, everyone saying, so I turn around and uh, the pilots and I obviously, uh, Steve, are you okay? Yeah, and I'll do the briefing. So I lean over the chair like that and I said, okay. Um, we need courts cock of start off my sit black in This may cut the external may cut so it's at this guy. But what it's about wet himself. He says, what's that? He says, oh, don't stand or crap on my seats. This is my cat. I'll stroke it as much as I want to. Man, I tell you, it, when when Puck started laughing, it was like, just like bottles falling over. Everyone just wet themselves. And then it was like PW sitting there trying to keep his straight face. You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we get in the aircraft and we bugger off. Very interesting trip that was. I really enjoyed that. Um, 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 the, next, the next sortie that I really... Um, I'd now obviously done it night vision operations with uh, with Alouettes, and I did a Puma night vision course. So it was pretty interesting. Back again with Ken von Straten, and uh, Ken von Straten is awesome chap. I mean, we had so much fun with him. Uh, really, <laughs> story about Ken and myself. Uh, Ken would get a little bit heavy with the hand when he starts with his brandy and cokes at uh, Swatco uh, if if was base. We go to the warrant officer's pub and uh, you get a little bit heavy and I thought, geez, Ken, you're a little bit drunk. Let me take you home. Take him home and then knock on the door and Razan would give it to us. She would be upset, I tell you. <laughs> you brought him home drunk, blah, 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 blah. So we learned our lesson. The next time we took our Ken home, stand him up against the door, knock, and as soon as the door handles up, you drop him and go. <laughs> <laughs> interesting but uh lovely lovely conversion i uh, really enjoyed the night vision goggles on the pumas amazing amount of work that you can do with those aircraft then i was deployed um my first uh, uh trip on a on a commercial boat the sa agalis down to marion island um that was quite that was quite amazing. Um, the one of the Pumas, uh, the J Model Puma Hotel India Zulu, is its registration. Actually, reached a thousand hours on that trip. So these were two brand new aircraft that had just been brought in in the 1980s, and uh, she'd reached a thousand hours. Interesting deploying. I was uh, deployed with uh, uh, with uh, Willem Bahrain as the uh, senior flight engineer, um, and uh, we really had an awesome time. You know, it was quite an amazing place to be. Uh, you're uh, cargo slinging uh, equipment around the island. You see these killer whales and the amazing amount of wildlife that you can see at, at, at uh, Marin Island. It's really, really fantastic. Um, the the beauty of Marion Island itself is, is phenomenal. We, 
uh, the, there were three of us, uh, uh, one of the, the electrical uh, uh, representative and the instrument Mackie, this old uh, Fossey and Rob, Robbie. The three of us went for a long walk on Marion Island uh, down to one of the coves. You come around there and there's all these little fur seal pups waddling around there, um, the albatrosses. It's really a phenomenal place to be. And uh, had a really, really enjoyable trip uh, with the uh, Jai model pumas on the SA Gullis. Uh, so I was on the one trip uh, coming back and uh, Villa Beret is quite a character. He's quite a character. He taught us how to sneak into the mess to get food. So you go to the back of the, the, the heli deck, open up one of the man mantle covers, you know, one of the access covers, walk down that, and then you into the, the bottom section of the kitchen. And then from there, then you go help yourself to food, and then you sneak out along the passages coming out. And we're a bottle of brandy strong at this stage. So there's this group of Air Force guys sneaking along the, the alleyways and the passages of the, of the ship. And we get to a corner, you go, shh, safe. And you pass it on. And the next guy goes, shh, safe, shh, safe. And we're going around the corner, around the corner, and next corner. And each corner we come to, shh, safe. So I'm right at the back, obviously. Billy's right up front, and he's busy passing it along. I get to, gets to the last corner, and he goes, shh. Safe, and I turn around. Good evening, Captain. <laughs> it's like Captain Billy Leaf following us all the way. <laughs> Needless to say, we were in a bit of trouble over that one. But Air Force was always in trouble, no matter where we went. Um, that um, trip itself to Marion Island was my first introduction into um, the J models. And I really, really enjoyed those aircraft incredibly. Then um, we did a weapons camp uh, with the normal Pumas to Rimfasmark. And uh, what the Puma does there is they place targets for uh, the fighter aircraft. So you would have a, a, a fiberglass target of a, of a Gaz 66 or a fiberglass target of a uh, a tank or something to that effect, you know, a Russian tank or a Russian transport vehicle, etc. And then we'd sling these out to the target areas so the fighters can come in and attack them. And uh, the one, uh, the one morning, I got up to the aircraft and I thought, "What the heck is this bird around the multi-purpose air intake filters of the Puma? On the side, you've got the holes where it expels the air, and then in the front, it's got the the uh, vortex generators for the filters themselves. Oh, what the heck? It's a bird popping in, popping out, popping in, popping out. So I, climb, I get the access ladder and I climb up to the top. Bird has got a whole pile of rocks, little pebbles and rocks. It's busy building its nest in the, in the filter. <laughs> so I had to clean that out. And uh, obviously from there onwards, we covered up all the holes so the birds couldn't build their nests in the, in the filters. Interesting trip to Rimfasmark. It was very, very interesting. Uh, experience. Um, then in uh, December of 1988, I had my first deployment down to the White House, to Antarctica. And um, I tried the uh, <laughs> the naughty uh, Billy Borain trick and stealing food. And I got caught by Captain Billy again. <laughs> so my punishment was to do bridge watch. So I had to go up onto the bridge and I had to do ice watch. So ice watch is looking out for icebergs and reporting things and just being the skivvy on the bridge, for example. But what an experience uh, to be able to, and to see the workings of a ship's bridge and how the interaction is between the captain and the crew, what the requirements are, how he, how he does the, the ice uh, uh, surveys to check which, which is the best route to follow and how he makes a decision to decide where he's going to break through ice, et cetera. It's quite, quite interesting. I really enjoyed that, uh, even though it was punishment. <laughs> it was a good trip. And um, the, um, the, the, the trip to Antarctica itself was uh, very interesting. Um, it's my first trip down there. I was deployed with uh, 
two other flight engineers. Uh, we always had th um, a number of three crews. So you've got two, two operating and then one on standby always uh, for the J models. When you deploy with the two aircraft to Antarctica, you've got no support structure. So everything that you need for those aircraft to last you the three months that you're there needs to be on board the ship or on board the, um, the base station where you're going to be staying at. And um, we, when we uh, offloaded the vessel, the, the ship itself, we would cargo sling most of the loads that needed to be slung off with the aircraft. So you, the first days of, of arrival at Antarctica, you would actually sling most of the uh, required sustenance and all the um, perishables straight off to um, transportation directly to the bases. Um, once you finish that two or three days of flying, then you would then deploy to the two areas. One is to the main base at Antarctica, and then the other one would be the mountain base, which is about 150 nautical miles further inland. Um, the one aircraft we deployed at uh, at the emergency base, uh, which is at the main base, I've got this base on stilts, uh, that was called the emergency base. And the other one uh, would be deploying to, uh, uh, to, to the uh, field site. Um, and um, the, the whole process of, of support is at that point in time to be able to um, fly the, um, the scientists, geoscientists, and uh, uh, the, 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 all the scientific episodes to support them in the fields. They would deploy with, uh, with uh, their uh, skidoos um, and tents and food supplies to go and be able to do their, their work out in the field. And then we would be their Kazavak standby and also supply standby uh, to go and get them uh, to 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 what give them the support that they needed. Then um, I was deployed at uh, Grudahogna, which was the deployed base, with um, the, uh, the other uh, flight engineer and a crew. The late Gary Hamilton was the chief pilot at that point in time, and um, there was a mix-up on a takeoff with a heavy aircraft one morning with uh, uh, the other flight engineer on, on board. And uh, they actually ran out of rotor RPM. Remember when I spoke to you about when you pull too much collective too quickly, the rotor RPM falls away and the aircraft fell out of the, fell out of the hover and uh, broke the nose and broke the tail off. So we had to recover this aircraft and uh, uh, the mechanic from the Sanai base came through with a, with a caterpillar and uh, a sled and uh, jumped out there and uh, I uh, started giving my advice and with the, between a group of us, we actually built the sled to put the broken aircraft on to tow it back to the main base. And Rod Alexander looked at me and says to me, I know you. I said, uh, I've got a very common face. <laughs> so he says, no, 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 no. You were at Lowfelt High School, weren't you, in Nelsbrand? I said, yes. He says, I was a year behind you at school. So we met up at this place in the furthest south to an actual fact bump into each other. Anyway, we, um, Chris Skitter, the Atlas chap, and myself, uh, we managed to uh, dig a hole under the nose of the aircraft because the nose wheel had broken, the, the uh, shock strut had broken off. So we dug a hole underneath the aircraft and I extended the nose wheel and then we put in a piece of water pipe to replace the hydraulic jack that had broken so that the, the aircraft could stand on its undercarriage again because the rear undercarriage was fine. And then we cut off the tail piece where it had broken, the whole tail boom, stripped off the engines, took off the gearbox, the blades, etc., to make it as light as possible. And then with the sled, we mounted, we actually cargo slung the, the aircraft with the other J model onto the, the sled that we built. We made a, a piece of U channel for the back wheels to fit in, and then a, a, a small piece at the front for the nose wheel to fit in, and 
cargo slung her onto that sled, tied her down onto the sled, and then loaded all the other parts onto another sled, and then towed her back to, um, to Sanai, the main base. So it was a good recovery, that. And uh, that aircraft was um, brought back to South Africa and uh, uh, flown up in a C-130 to Atlas Aircraft Corporation, where they actually repaired her and put her back together again. Very interesting story that was, but uh, immensely enjoyable. Then um, it was uh, in uh, 1989 when I had the, uh, being on a maritime squadron, you're, you're always doing rescue um, of mountain climbers and uh, vessels that uh, run aground and you've got to go take the crew off and so on. And um, I was fortunate enough to fly with uh, the late Gary Hamilton and uh, Des Willeblaber, two awesome pilots. Uh, we were called out one night. Um, unfortunately, I was the only night qualified night vision goggle engineer at the squadron at the time. And um, I got the NVGs ready, set the cockpit up. We have to replace the, the um, lighting in, in the cockpit. It took me about an hour and a half to get all that done. And uh, we uh, deployed to go and do this rescue. Um, it was one of those stormy Cape nights. So obviously we were fighting rain and wind and everything, but we managed to get everybody off the, off the vessel as well and uh, get them back safely to the shore. Um, their fishing uh, vessel was completely destroyed. Totally destroyed. Interesting uh, rescue we did there. And then um, um, we started introducing the night vision goggle training to the rest of the squadron. And we deployed on uh, the SS Tafelberg, a Navy vessel with uh, the huge flight deck uh, between the hangars and the bridge. Um, and uh, very, very interesting trips that we did there with uh, NVGs to bring the crews up to speed and understand how to operate it. Uh, the Navy was immensely impressed at the way that we were able to, to, to do those types of sorties. Um, now we were reaching the, the end of uh, the war, basically. <laughs> it's 1989 and there was very few. It was more operating with uh, the uh, UN and um, trying to uh, get to some amicable, peaceful negotiation of how we do things. Um, as my last actual tour, and it was done from uh, Air Force Base Rindu again. Um, it was more in support of um, the UN forces, and uh, we operated with uh, uh, the UN um, uh, flight crews as well. So they would fly their Bell uh, Hueys and, um, and other smaller aircraft. There was one operation where the guy was flying his Huey to Italian pilots and uh, we landed on the road and they came in past us and uh, proceeded to cut down a tree while with their blades while they were coming into land. And I walked over to the guy and said to him, you better check your blades out. He said, what? I said, you better check your blades out. You just chopped down a tree. He says, no, I didn't. So I walk up to the blade. You could actually see the sap still dripping off it. <laughs> Fortunately, not much damage. <laughs> that's, that's, that was quite an operation. Um, I finished up my tour there and um, got back to Cape Town to complete my engineering studies. Um, last block that I would be doing. And uh, it was putting me in line now to decide what I was going to be doing with my future career. Now, Steve, we've come to the end of your career as far as it's concerned with the border ends, but this is by far not the end of your career. We'll do that in the next episode. And I have to thank you. You've been talking here, yeah, I've been listening, I've been making notes. Man, this is just fascinating. I'm so glad we're learning about this. It's something I've never known about. I mean, I've seen your people walking around, but you know, you, you never... You never even speak to air crew while they're busy there around the aircraft. They, they get violent. In my, uh, in my opinion and in my experience, uh, I, 
I recall my late wife, if you spoke to her at all while she was doing pre-flight, she would smack you. There's no left or right about it. And then and she would also tell you to sit on your hands. You don't touch yeah. anything. But you don't even talk unless you have to. And that's only to go to the bathroom. Because it was really like that. So now I need to ask you, the relationship between you and the pilots, I mean, they're obviously officers. You people are non-commissioned officers, warrant officers. But while you're in the air, would, would you consider it informal? Um, it's uh, more, more on a professional level for the simple reason that you respect the rank. But at the same time, uh, your, your input is as important as any decision making. And uh, whether the pilot is a general or whether he's a lieutenant, um, his request for you to perform a task that needs to be done, he needs your professional input. And um, understanding that respect between the, the air crew itself has led um, the South African Air Force to, in actual fact, in the earlier years, develop what they call the cockpit management course. And that cockpit management course was to reiterate the, the urgency and the importance of working together as a crew and respect each one's crew's position. Okay, so, so it's professional airmen, so there's no real crash here, and if there is a crash, you can sort it out. It, it's not a problem. Correct. Correct, yeah. There will be occasions where you'll find that uh, there's some people that uh, do abuse their privilege and rank, etc. But uh, there are ways and means of resolving those issues very quickly. How far does this go? If, if you consider a pilot to be unsafe or there's something wrong with him, uh, is there a duty upon you to, to speak up? Um, in my professional opinion, that's what I would do, yes. And um, you have the, the, um, uh, the safety officer of the base that you can always report to. Um, and that is making sure it's not chastising a pilot or looking to get somebody in trouble, but it's raw, uh, more... To, to investigate the situation and find a resolution so that uh, it doesn't lead to a dangerous situation. That, that seems to me a very fair system. Can I ask you about this 20 millimeter cannon of yours on the gunships? Because I've, I've heard these things fire. It's really, it's magic. It's really magic. Oh, yes, it seems to possible. me the aircraft actually move aside. It might be an illusion, I don't know. Does it really move or does it just look like that? It does look like it, but uh, it's Puff the Magic Dragon, yeah? <laughs> now, the 20 mil cannon, the DFA 20 mil cannon, is probably the nicest, uh, or at least the M uh, 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 um, that 20 mil cannon is probably one of the most um, uh, effective weapons that uh, I've ever operated with. Uh, you know, on uh, the days that I did my flight at the conversion, we used to have the Favre Brownings, uh, Twin Pack Favre Browning. You had the... Um, the 303, uh, then you had the binocular system for uh, 303 Brownings, um, then the 20 mil cannon. And out of all of those, the 20 mil cannon was always the most effective. Uh, you could clear stoppages quickly. You could, if the cannon breaks, you use a bypass mechanism. You know, there's always something that you could do to get the thing operating. Where the other systems that were developed were pretty fly by night, as you know, you would have a stoppage on, on the four uh, 303 Brownings. Um, and you'd end up firing with one, you know, that type of thing. Uh, the the, the Favre Browning would actually start ripping the aircraft because it has got a huge recoil fire, where the 20 mil cannon had a recoil system. So it might look like it's pushing the aircraft, but the recoil system itself was so effective that the hydraulic um, uh, uh, recoil mounts uh, were really effective, you know. That's wonderful weapon, wonderful weapon. In fact, when it was mounted on the hydraulic system, the servo system, it was even more effective. Really a good, good weapon. What would be the typical cannon load? Would you load high explosives with tracer and then ball? Or? No, most, most of the, the standard, standard operating um, loading was uh, four HE, one ball. And um, I would often have... Um, a, a string of, of about 50 ball rounds in case um, I end up with uh, some type of uh, armored vehicle that you, you want to make a lot of noise in and ring their ears. <laughs> yes, well, that happened. 
Um, we found the Savati uh, battle the other day, and one of the concepts of the weights actually attacked an armored column. And I believe a pilot got a narrow script there. Yeah. Um, they got shot off quite badly. I mean, so these people were shooting back. So yeah. you were always shooting in short bursts, if I remember correctly, very short bursts. Yeah, well, you see the, the 20 mils got a, uh, got a, floating, a floating barrel. So um, when you fire three shots, it'll fi fire in a triangle. So if you give it, if you start allowing it to get out of control by just holding the trigger down, she grows bigger and bigger. So it's best to give her a, and uh, you know, the more you get to know the weapon, the more control you have over it. And, um, I got so, I got so used to the cannon at a point in time that I could fire one shot at a time. So yeah, you, know, you pick up your things, slap her, take another target, slap her, you know. And the, the 20 mil H has got a five meter killing radius anyway. So just in hard ground, find the right target, you're you're on target. Were you never uh, scared or, or concerned that you might be shooting at friendlies, uh, hitting your own people? It's confusion in battle. I mean, I, I understand that. Um, we, you know, fortunately, we uh, when we operated with the with the troops, you know, whether they are Kufut or whether uh, their army or whether they're special force or whoever uh, we always 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 when you establish communication first thing that you do is how do you identify them and uh, Dago panels was one um, it just how the way that they were following up was another but uh, I've never really ever heard of a situation where any choppers have actually f um, fired at uh, our own troops there's always been a an opportunity to to identify correctly. I am smiling here because we also did the off super um, special with Nellis and uh, Kenny Swartz, and I think Pete. Can't remember Pete's other name now. Um, I'm sure you'll forgive me for that. And there was something going on between uh, Kenneth Swartz, and we're recording him this week also. It's entire the Nima Nellis. But you were also in that aircraft. So now I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. focusing in a bit. Uh, Kenny is saying that uh, you people tried to shoot him and, and uh, Nala said something, yeah, it's sadly we missed. Uh, what happened that day? Was that in the gully when yeah. you got uh, Kenny, there? Kenny was, was, was being bombarded with uh, the, the swapper that was stuck on the other side of the ravine. And I saw the, I saw the swapper over there. So I said to him, Nellis, I've got them. So I took him out. But it was just across the ring from, from Kenny, <laughs> and he thought we were shooting at them. But I could see them perfectly. I knew exactly where they were. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a matter of, look, I'm taking out your enemy. I'm not taking out you. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just so really fun, you know. We're just taking each yeah. other. Well, 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 you're all Dane in the same operation. Yeah? Uh, the moment we started shooting close to the ravine, he was just down to the left, and he would jump. He would jump on the radio straight away and say, can you see me? Can you see me? Look at my day glow. Look at my day glow. <laughs> yeah, it must be confusing. But now I have to ask you, um, that very same operation was planned by uh, General Bowman. He was a colonel when yeah. later became a head of Special Forces Brigade. And something happened there which you didn't touch upon, a fishing expedition. Now, I need to understand, did that actually happen or not? Because Nellis was, was sort of admitting guilt and then he decided, no, he's not going to admit guilt. Uncle Boris, General Bowman, as we know him, is absolutely convinced that the fuel was thrown out for a fishing expedition and that's why they did the paradrop for you. Um, any comments? <laughs> um. I love the way you put me in the freaking in the, in the post. Um, we we uh, uh, we went uh, we went for a um, uh, uh, we needed to go and get some fresh food. Ra uh, ration packs were starting to get to the guys, and we needed to get them some fresh food. And uh, we just took a, a a trip out to go and see if we could get some fish and uh, um, maybe uh, you know some antelope or buck or two, you know. So, and that's about as far as I'm going to go. 
Bobo, Bobo, si but I, I, will, I will tell you. <laughs> I, will, I, I will tell you though that uh, a bunch of naked guys running around on a beach got a bit of sunburn in places that they shouldn't have. <laughs> Man, I can imagine that with a stomach nose. <laughs> okay, let's drop it. Let's drop it. <laughs> Let me get to Terry the Lion. A few people, have you ever met uh, Terry? I've heard about the Puma pilot who got a fright of his life and he stole his bed. This is for yeah. the special forces at Fort Doppies. Yeah, well, <laughs> uh, the, 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 the common trick is not to, to, to inform anybody about Terry the Lion because Terry was a really lovable animal and love to love to surprise people and specifically jump on their beds at night when they're sleeping. And uh, um, I don't know if you've ever heard the story about Pug Boetu who met Terry. He went to the toilet the night and Terry jumped on his back. <laughs> he screamed like a mad pig. <laughs> well, I've heard some stories. I think it was always in uh, James Taker who was telling us about something which happened. Everybody is talking about Terry and Puck and the things which went wrong that day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there was there was one episode at Amiga where um, the three two battalion guys decided to get the better of uh, us Air Force guys. So the late Arthur Walker, myself, uh, and a couple of the other guys, we were, uh, I think, four gunships deployed to Amiga. And uh, uh, we ended up potting the whole night long and uh, obviously pretty hung over the next morning when all of a sudden uh, there was uh, huge explosions and gunfire right outside our, our door because we were right next to the, 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 the pit. And we come out there and yes, <laughs> yes, the RSM standing there giggling his, his lungs out because we, I mean, we just, scattered that place who came leopard crawling out of the blooming bungalow in the meantime it was them just trying to see if, how we would react so there's many stories like that well we're going to get to all of them in, in the next episode i made <laughs> notes but now just for me, those people there might be people here we don't know where's marion island um can yeah. you just say i mean it's flipping far south it's it, it's really yeah. not close to south africa now if you if you take from the tip of southern africa and you go straight down to Antarctica. If you make a straight line, on the left-hand side of your line is a little island called Marion Island. Okay, And then on the right-hand side of that line is Gogh Island. And those are the two South African manned weather stations um, that uh, the SA Agullis also service, services um, during the year. Would these uh, J uh, Pumas, would they also be there or would they only be at um, Antarctica proper? Yes, the, the J model Pumas were uh, procured by the Department of Environmental Affairs and the Air Force was, uh, was uh, 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 maintained them and also uh, kept them um, at the squadron. So the deployment with those two J models was always with the SA Gullis, uh, wherever it went. So it would go to the islands and it would go to Antarctica. There was one um, uh, episode where we had to recover the, the J models and they were in fact being repaired that we would deploy a military Puma in, in, instead to, to the islands. I think I've seen somewhere actually one of these helicopters landing on the uh... U.S. aircraft carrier. Well, That's right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know about that? Yep. Yep. That those uh, we you know uh, when the Drakensberg deployed to to um, the United States, um, uh, they actually operated off the U.S. vessels as well. Yeah, that's fascinating. But now I have to to also in, tell the viewers here. You also an offer. You wrote the book. Tell oh. me about this book and, and let me say also we will come back and we'll have a complete legacy book um, show on it. But just shortly, uh, tell us about your book. Um, it was really interesting. You know, when I, I immigrated to Canada um, in the mid-2000s, um, you end up in, in so many discussions with many people. And 
it's the misnomer of what South Africa is. Um, you racists and God knows whatever. And it's so far from the truth because the military was totally integrated. Um, some of my best friends are of other color. Um, uh, there's, there's a, a recce, uh, a story for another day, but there's a recce, a black recce who's an ex uh, uh, um, Angolan soldier who joined the reccees and him and his wife, a Cuban wife used to come and visit our place quite often. Uh, the integration is what people never understood. So I found myself at every every barbecue or braai or any party I went to, having to try and convince these people all the time. So much so that I decided I would rather write the history of Southern Africa and then embed my through my eyes what I saw. And once I'd completed that, I actually felt much better about it that I could give them direction to go read the truth about what South Africa really is. I fully understand that. It's one of the reasons why we started the Legacy Channel is I got tired of explaining to people who really don't know much, but they think they do. Yeah. Um, and I'm not pointing fingers. What I'm saying is you have to hear both sides of the story before you can actually judge. That is basic yeah. law. There's nothing strange about it. It's called the Audi Alter and Partum Rule. Yeah. And then you can judge. And if you judge, you should judge impartially. In other words, be neutral, listen to both sides, and then you can know. Now, I'm going to leave uh, um, links for this book at the end of this uh, video. So if people want to get hold of this book, I'm sure they can, they can get it online. Yes. Well, Internet, we've come to the end of this episode. I can tell you I've enjoyed this thoroughly. Steve, I have to thank you. You've opened my eyes to a great many things which I didn't know. And I'm sure there's a lot of the viewers who also didn't know. We like the way you talk as well. It's quite funny, to be honest. I myself was looking forward to read your book. If it's in the same way as you talk, and it most, most certainly will be, I'm quite sure. Then you know what? That's a damn good book. And I hope that people will support you. And I want to say to everybody else, if you have a story, if you think you have a story, just come and talk to us. Tell us your story. Don't let the story die with you. Don't, don't, don't think that people are going to laugh at you and call you a GB or, a, you know, there were all these horrible names which we were called unnecessary. So um, come and talk to us. Tell your story to the world and let us bring the truth out. So that the other people who uh, quick to judge, but perhaps they can come and listen first and ask questions before we jump on the bandwagon. So until we meet again, God bless.